Good afternoon and welcome to day two of the Conference on European Economic Integration. Allow me to extend a special welcome again to the speakers and participants following the conference online. On WebEx, thank you for joining us. We look forward to hearing from you during the Q&A sessions again, where you can either use the chat or the raise hand symbol. I'm Ingrid, and I'm going to guide you through the afternoon again. We hope that you had a great time at dinner last night. And I don't know about you, but I was dreaming in charts. <laughs> Not in tables, but I was dreaming in charts last night, which goes to show that I was still processing all the great inputs we received yesterday. And more lie ahead of us today. Birgit Niesner, Director of the Economic Analysis and Research Department, is going to kick off the program today, and she's going to introduce our second keynote speaker, Guntram Wolf, who is going to talk about economic restructuring with alternative energy supplies. After that, we are also going to have two sessions. The first one is going to zero in on short-term responses to rising inflation and com commodity prices and we'll also cover some fiscal policy aspects. The second session will examine how structural policies and the green transition can help address long-term supply challenges. Of course, all these challenges are having serious implications for banks as well. And so the conference it will draw to a close with a panel on banks in transition, and this panel will be chaired by the Vice Governor of the Österreichische Nationalbank, Gottfried Haber. We are going to have one break again, and if you haven't done so, please pick up one of the folders showcasing our bank's expertise in CZ economies and some of the products that we offer. And please also take a closer look at the poster that we have prepared for you that highlights the UNB's Euro survey and has some charts on it as well. So with a few to running a tight ship, Birgit, uh, the floor is yours now. Thank you very much, Ingrid. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very glad to welcome you to the second day of our conference. I hope you have enjoyed the first day as much as I did. I'll run through the highlands very shortly of yesterday. I start with Professor Kaminski, who reminded us of previous exceptional crisis. I have learned the terminus rare disasters from her, and she appealed for, she raised our vigilance against newly arising financial fractures, especially in emerging economies. The current outlook is dim, but not hopeless. That's what I took away. And we had insight from Mario Holzner. I don't see him here, but he went then into the region and um, said also that there is some sign of hope. There are silver lines, especially regarding funding, RRF funds, and nearshoring opportunities for the region we are covering today. However, monetary policy is challenged, whereby central banks in CZ have started hiking much earlier um, than in than the ECB or other, uh, other banks, central banks in advanced countries. Um, further, these central banks in the region are already taking measures to address potential financial stability issues. Of course, we cannot ignore that apart from the current volatility, we have structural issues which are there and which will re-emerge also after the crisis, such as the rapid aging of the region, which was covered in a very good panel at the end of the program. And we know that the challenging cocktail of flight, migration, brain drain and aging will keep the region busy for more time to come. Um, at the dinner, we had a very positive news. Um, I know that Sanya is among us. We had a wonderful keynote speaker, and um, she is from the Croatian National Bank, and Croatia will adopt the euro on January 1st, 2023. So I think we can all um, enjoy good news at this um, current difficult times. Today we will start with a keynote on a different topic, also a structural topic, Europe's energy dependency, and I have a very distinguished keynote speaker sitting at my side already. I'll just set um, the stage with a few um, numbers or with a few 
current status numbers on the energy dependency of the region. Uh, as you know, UNB also has a very strong focus on CZ countries and we monitor this um, gas dependency, oil dependency, energy dependency overall. And um, our research, for instance, has, has it that we all think that traditionally the wisdom says that the dependency on oil, for instance, is the, in the region is very high. But if you put the gross imports in relation to actual consumption, and if you also regard that some of this oil is re-exported again, you find out that the dependency on oil is not so strongly different from Western European EU members than in our region. What is also, of course, there and cannot be um, discussed away is that um, gas is a very important energy source for CZ. Um, and we all know that Russia has already stopped to be a reliable supplier of gas before the start of the war. But we also see energy suppliers reacting rapidly in the region. And um, we see dependency numbers falling for the region. And we see that, for instance, initiatives like the EU Economic and Investment Plan take up this issue and work in the right direction. Um, other sources of gas. I, I will leave the floor on the really sustainable options, of course, to my key speaker. But as a short-term solution, LNG gas is also becoming more prominent in the region. Many of you already know probably about the um, um, LNG terminal on the Croatian island of Kirk. But probably less known is that also Albania has an LNG terminal in Flora, that Montenegro is working on the Bar LNG terminal, and last but not least, an LNG facility in Greece also will help to reduce the dependency on pipeline gas coming to the region from Russia. So we will, policymakers, countries, regions have to take a lot of right decisions in the future for the right energy mix. Uh, we will learn more, I'm sure, from Guntram on this, and we all know that dirty habits are hard to break, but I really look um, forward that he will take us beyond the normal horizon. Guntram is probably known to most of you as the director of Pugel Institute in Brussels, but he has taken on a very new challenge this summer. He is now the CEO of the German Council on Foreign Relations, and I must say that I find this extremely interesting that economists like um, Guntram Wolf um, change to a non-economist think tank and think defense, dependency, strategy with other disciplinary scholars, yeah, but with an economist input. Yeah. So I think for me it's high time, it's really extremely interesting in the right direction what you are doing. Apart from this, of course, he has published a lot in leading academic journals. I can also say that I can chair a panel with one of the 28 most influential power players in Europe. This was the title he earned from the Business Insider in 2020. And he's the one to have on international councils. Yeah? So I just named one, the G20 high-level independent panel has Guntram Wolf as an advisor, as a member. All this super career started in the Deutsche Bundesbank. So there are the, the, the central banks are an interesting place to start. Congratula congratulations on your career and looking forward to your input, Contra. Well, th thank you so much, uh, Birgit, for these very, very nice words. And um, I have to say, uh, of course, especially for the central bank reference, um, because um, I really have fond memories of my time also in the central bank, I have to say. It's, uh, it's been a great time in the Bundesbank uh, research department and also in the uh, economics department doing with a lot of time for really basic research, um, the, I mean applied, but but pretty pretty fundamental research. So so I think uh, central banks are really a great place also for economic research, and um, and thank you uh, Robert Holzmann for the invitation. It's great to be here again, and um, I remember the last time I was sitting here um, was actually uh, a few months after the start of the war when. Uh, w, um, IIW um, Institute um, had its, its annual conference here. And we discussed, of course, um, the war and, and its consequences. Um, 
And here we are, um, the war is still going on. And of course, um, the war still continues to have major um, consequences, not just in the military and strategic realm, but also in the economic realm and, and, and in the energy mix. And I was sort of given the task to, to think about um, economic restructuring with alternative energy supplies. And, um, and I thought I would start from um, an assessment of the situation, starting to look at, uh, at Germany's um, role and Germany's importance also in providing energy to Central and Eastern Europe at the current juncture. Um, and then think a bit more about sort of the medium and perhaps at the end we have a bit of time to talk about the long term um, and how our energy supplies will, will change. And I think there should be a PowerPoint that I hope someone can put up there um, so that I can get going. Uh, yeah, voila, that's, that's it. The, the starting point is obviously um, the, uh, the war in, in Ukraine. Uh, what has happened in the energy field is that first there was roughly half a year of uh, debate about how to sanction Russia in the energy field. Um, that debate uh, took a lot of time and a lot of energy, but what it did, of course, it created a lot of uncertainty about Russia's capacity to supply global energy market markets. And since Russia is a major supplier, the biggest um, uh, gas supplier in the world and the second biggest oil supplier in the world before the war, um, uh, that had, of course, consequences for global energy prices. Um, and um, eventually, um, in, um, in July, there was an agreement both at the G7 in Elmo, but also at the European Council, uh, to um, install and uh, um, phase in certain certain sanctions, especially on gas, on oil there was, uh, especially on oil, um, on on coal there was already um, some sanctions before, but coal was relatively unimportant for for Russia's revenues, while um, oil and gas is actually quite ce quite central um, for for the revenues of the Kremlin. Um, and so, so the oil um, will uh, will start to be sanctions uh, be sanctioned um, uh, in um, actually this month. Um, but but the real issue is actually the gas. And formally, it wasn't the European Union or the West that has sanctioned Russian gas, but de facto the Russians um, have stopped um, to a large extent supplying Europe Europe with gas. Um, and uh, Russia uh, Russian gas was. Um, the most important source of, uh, of gas um, for large parts of Central and Eastern Europe and also, of course, um, for, for Germany. Um, and so the reaction was uh, accordingly very severe. The price signal was very severe. And there was a lot of uh, worries about the consequences that this shock would have on the European and the German and the East European um, economy. So, so let's let's have a look at um, what I want to do. So I want to talk a bit about the gas price shock in detail and the and the German reaction to it. Uh, then talk about the gas supply to Central and Eastern Europe, and then talk about short-term alternative energy supplies. Uh, and then the medium term is the renewable energy expansion of LNG. You refer to it um, and the new pipeline infrastructure for non-Russian gas supplies. And then perhaps in the conclusion, we can talk a bit about um, sort of the long term where I guess Ellen, uh, um, green hydrogen will play a bigger role. Okay, so, so the gas price shock, um, of course, um, it has dampened consumer spending and placed a burden on production in energy intensive industries. But doomsday scenarios that were circulating still at the beginning of um, the Russian invasion uh, into Ukraine, that this would be lead to a meltdown of uh, European industry, a meltdown of German industry, um, have proven um, wrong, have not, um, have not materialized. What happened is that um, many industrial uh, processes managed to actually um, substitute energy intensive parts of their production, um, move that abroad to places where energy is cheaper, um, and also households actually manage to um, decrease their consumption of, of gas, of energy, quite substantially. Um, the German numbers are around 20 to 30 percent, um, the gas savings. So these are very s substantial gas savings. And um, essentially what, what happened in the industry sector is that um, 
the, the core of the value chains remained, but the very energy intensive parts could, could be displaced um, to other locations. And so therefore the worst, worst the bad scenarios that were initially feared uh, by some uh, did not materialize. Accordingly, uh, GDP, um, and this is German GDP, um, has, um, has seen an effect, but it's not been a meltdown. I mean, we are basically moving from 1.7% uh, growth in, in 22 to, to minus point, uh, point 0.2 uh, in 23. So far away from what some people were, were thinking, uh, people were, were, were fearing up to 10% uh, loss of GDP. This, this did not materialize. Now, what, what happened uh, and how did, how did Germany uh, react and try to sort of deal with this huge shock um, in, in, uh, in energy prices? And I will talk about the supply side in a minute, but here I talk uh, more about sort of the fiscal side and the, the fiscal reaction to it. Um, and I know that uh, Veronika Grimm um, is um, is here in the in the room. I don't see her now, but she, she, ah, yeah, over there. And she has worked very intensively um, as chair of the German Gas Commission on uh, on the question of how to design um, the um, the energy relief package that the German government agreed on, which um, was known as Doppelwumms or double kaboom. Um, and um, uh, uh, amounted to 200 billion uh, euros. So these 200 billion euros caused a lot of anxiety in the rest of Europe. Uh, everybody was sort of calling Berlin, what's happening? You're spending 200 billion. Uh, aren't you driving up um, gas demand like crazy at our expense? Um, and uh, the reality is that to a large, large extent that will not be the case because the way um, this um, gas support schemes are scheduled uh, or are designed, um, uh, are designed in a way that um, they incentivize uh, gas savings. Th so they don't incentivize um, further consumption, which would be, of course, totally counterproductive, but they incent incentivize gas, gas savings. Um, now, having said that, um, it's clear that um, the, um, the core um, of the measures relies on the fact that there's a higher gas price, right? And so, so there is a price signal and this price signal is what leads to a reduction in demand um, of gas. And that price signal remains in place. It will be somewhat reduced for part of the consumption, but it remains in place. And the reality, of course, as a result is that um, uh, European and German um, energy prices will be significantly and are significantly higher than in other places of the world after Russia basically uh, stopped, stopped the supply. So, so this I, I, I stole from from Veronica, uh, Veronica Grimm, but but this basically shows uh, shows the future, or from the expert council um, uh, of the German government, uh, Sachverständigenrat, um, and it shows it shows the um, energy prices um, futures um, for um, Europe in comparison to the U.S. And you see that for quite a, quite a. Um, uh, a period of time, uh, essentially energy will be more expensive, significantly more expensive in, in Europe um, uh, um, than, in, than in the United States. Now, m meanwhile, um, the, um, meanwhile the, um, the gas storages are full, um, gas consumption is down, um, and we have actually floating gas storages now outside in the North Sea, North sea um, which are basically LNG tankers that don't uh, deliver the gas to Europe at the moment because the prices um, have been extremely low. We ha even had a moment where they have been negative now um, when the gas storages were full and it was still warm. Um, well, you couldn't supply further because uh, basically the gas couldn't go anywhere. And so the gas storage became a, f a floating gas storage outside of the coast. Um, but now as uh, gas consumption is of course um, increasing, uh, with the colder weather, um, these uh, gases, this gas will be will be delivered. Um, now, I wanted to show this, but let me uh, skip this in the interest of time and move to gas supplies to to Eastern and, and Central Europe, and and how the situation looks there. And I mean, this picture is, uh, and here I borrow from um, well, my my former job uh, from from Bruegel and. Um, and Spiegel made, uh, the Spiegel magazine made a nice graph based on, on Bruegel statistics. 
And what it shows is uh, it shows um, prior to um, the crisis, of course, the uh, very significant gas dependency on Russia um, that was particularly si significant in the in the east of, of Europe, but e but also in, in Germany. And the bigger the square, uh, the more um, gas demand there is. But you see that uh, in a country like Germany, uh, more than 50 percent of the, g the gas came from Russia. In Poland, it's much more. Um, in Hungary as well, so so there's really significant dependencies uh, prior prior to the to the war. Now, um, how how did the gas come to to the center of Europe prior to the prior to the war? Well, these are sort of uh, the key arrows um, with the key pipelines, and you see there's there's all these pipelines basically from Russia, and and now imagine imagine they they are basically. Um, uh, all stopping or close to stopping, except for the the, the southern one, uh, uh, Turk Stream. Um, but the other ones are basically coming coming close to zero. Um, and so, so how how did we replace this gas? Right. I mean, th this and in in such a short period of time. So so this is. Um, an attempt to depict this, and I think we are still working a bit on the graphics here. But but basically, what um, what has become much more important is two things. Um, let me see whether this, yeah, this works. So, so, so one is uh, Norwegian gas um, has become much, much more important. Um, and we have uh, increased LNG imports um, through uh, Belgium, but also through the Netherlands. Um, so, so there's been a sick, and you see these arrows here are gone. Um, this one is almost, uh, this one has become a reverse arrow, right? I mean, so, so it's now, uh, there's some gas flowing from from west to east to the Baltic countries, uh, but but essentially you see here there's a big gap in in, in gas inflows. And the question is, uh, how will this be replaced, and how is it replaced in the in the short term? And um, well, let me let me try to show first uh, first this chart. So so this we we compiled based on based on uh, data from the, the Bundesnetzagentur, the German um, um, Federal Network Agency. Um, and uh, what it shows is, um, is the importance of the, the LNG and the Norwegian gas. Um, uh, but it also shows um, the importance of Germany actually passing on uh, gas to uh, central, um, I mean, basically to, uh, to uh, uh, to uh, I mean, Poland is not so important, and I will talk about Poland in a minute. But basically, Czech Republic, which is then a pipeline going through to uh, to Slovakia, um, and and of course Austria. And so 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 this is uh, this is the picture um, of October um, this year. So so just last month. Huh? So so you see a, a pretty significant redirection of of gas flows in a relatively short period. Um, of time, um, and um, the key question is, of course, um, this here in the middle, um, the usage and the storage. Um, how much is the usage going to go up um, in the winter? As I've argued, the way the gas price commission has designed um, the support schemes, um, this will be moderate. I mean, so there will be, of course, a winter increase, but it will, I mean, the incentive is there to save, right? And so, so this is key. If, if Germany starts uh, uh, consuming too much, then there will be pressure, of course, on uh, passing on gas, gas elsewhere, and 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 sort of the um, the uh, integrity um, of the single market uh, for um, energy is really one of the most um, most important things for the winter going forward. Because if that is undermined, um, then we have um, very quickly very significant. Um, uh, economic costs, and to show that, um, to show that, I did want to show um, this little chart from from the International Monetary Fund that that compares um, two scenarios: um, one in which um, there is um, a, a fully functioning gas market and gas flows to where it's most scarce in in the European Union, and one where um, basically this does not happen. And as you can see, uh, uh, I mean, the one where it does not happen is the the, the dark blue. Um, the the impact on GDP then accordingly would be would be much bigger. And I mean, it's very clear if if Germany were not to deliver gas to let's say Czech uh, Czech Republic and Slovakia, 
it would hit us back um, through the value chains, which are extremely integrated. And, and I think people have understood this, but I think still, uh, I think it's important to, to realize and visualize how important it is in the current situation, not only to save gas, but to continue to let gas flow freely um, in the European, in the European um, Union. How am I doing on time? Five more minutes? Yes. Okay, so so let me. Um, I have too many slides. Uh, okay, so 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 medium term. Um, what what can we do medium term, and what could happen happen medium term? Uh, well, I mean, the big hope, of course, is um, that uh, wind and solar expansion in the EU is gonna is gonna fix the issue and is gonna replace um, Russian um, gas um, now. Well, the first uh, um, chart uh, shows that um, the, the build-up of renewables um, in the last few years has not been terribly impressive, right? I mean, so, so if we've, I mean, the German numbers is zero, right? I mean, there hasn't been an increase. Um, sorry, where's Germany? Um, this, I think this is Germany and this is, this is the Netherlands, right? So this is Germany, uh, not much increase in Germany, a little bit in some other countries, but but basically um, it hasn't been so impressive uh, in the last years. Um, now, do we need to be pessimistic? Um, well, I mean, let's let's look at the next slide. Um, this is more more specifically uh, more specifically Germany. Uh, so, what do we see here? We see um, a build-up um, of um, energy generation from renewables in Germany, but it has peaked in 2020. So, so it's, also, it's also coming down. But of course, and that I steal again from, uh, from uh, Veronika Grimm and, and, the, uh, and the German Expert Council, um, there is a big push to build up in the next eight years. But this is not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. Um, but um, it's, of course, a, a serious attempt to do this. Um, and um, the, uh, the European approach to this is called um, the um, uh, Repower EU. Um, and according to the plans of Repower EU, um, if all the build-up of um, renewables happens according to the re this plan, um, the Russian gas could be replaced uh, in the next five years um, from renewables. But it's a big if, right? I mean, you have to really ramp up the, uh, the build-up of these renewable technologies very, very quickly. Now, let me show you one chart which um, uh, I, I also found. And so here I, I have three different sources. One is again uh, Brügel, that's the one here on the left. Uh, but these are, are different sources, Eurostat, and I forgot, which I think this is Infolink. So, so what we've seen is um, as the crisis started, um, there has been a huge expansion in um, the import of solar panels. Um, and so, so, so people have reacted to the price signal and really start buying solar panels. I mean, people talk about it, you know, how can I put a solar panel on my balcony and all of these things. Um, and, you know, you see it in the numbers. I mean, there's really an increase in, in solar, uh, solar imports. Now, what I find remarkable in this chart, however, is uh, not only that there has been this increase in solar solar panel imports, but that uh, China plays such a big role in, in these imports. So we basically procure um, our solar panels from China. Um, and, um, um, and, and so why, why do I show these two different charts? I mean, this one is here with uh, in values, and this is in in gigawatt, um, and so, so even in gigawatt, you see a very clear increase. So it's not just price driven, it's also quantity driven, really. You see this very clear increase. And so China, yeah, why, uh, uh, what does it mean? Well, I think it raises at least the question, um, how do we deal with new um, strategic, uh, possible strategic dependencies from, from China in the solar panel field? And what do we need to do? Uh, to uh, perhaps uh, diversify um, the supply of the global supply of solar panels um, to be uh, less dependent and more resilient to possible shocks coming coming out of China. So I think this is certainly a big debate we should we should be having, and China uh, currently um, jumps in, and I think everybody should be grateful that they jump in because it's cheap solar panels, right? Um, but uh, it can raise new dependencies that we we need to we need to. Um, 
uh, think about and take, take into account. Um, LNG import capacity, uh, I think we already talked about it, but part of the response has been to try to increase the capacity to import um, uh, gas um, through, um, through floating or fixed terminals. And here the good news, I mean, uh, the, 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 um, the Wilhelmshaven um, port has been in the press, but basically there's a very significant build-up in, in the next years um, of LNG uh, import capacity. So, so this will help um, secure supplies um, and reduce um, our dependency on, on Russia. There have also been projects of, of common interest, um, uh, so that's, that's EU projects, and they have focused quite a bit on the, on the, uh, on the southern uh, European region, bringing in um, so southeast European region, bringing in basically gas, gas supplies um, to, uh, to the Balkans and up to Hungary, um, which is very important because Hungary is still very uh, dependent, of course, on, on Russian gas directly. Okay, so so let me uh, let me conclude um, with a few a few remarks. I think the first one uh, I made very clear already, but let me repeat it: maintaining the integrity of the energy market is particularly crucial for the economies of gas-dependent Eastern European countries, and by virtue of their interdependence, also for the German and the Central European economy. Germany's function as a European gas transit hub has increased in importance um, in the short term uh, for short-term security of supply um, of the eastern neighbors, um, and this is due to the replacement of Russian gas deliveries through LNG and gas from, from Norway. I haven't talked about it, but the pipeline infrastructure from Norway is particularly critical um, and needs to be protected against hybrid attacks. Um, that's my new hat, the security hat. Um, but, but I think, I mean, even at my old um, job, I talked about hybrid threats. But I think this is really something we have to take very seriously. And there's some evidence that um, uh, there's Russian activities around that pipeline. And, so, so, uh, and I know that a lot of um, efforts are being put into securing that pipeline. Um, because it has become so crucial for the provisioning of gas to, to Central Europe. In the short and medium term, the emergence of new interconnections and expanded LNG ca capacity in the Baltics and Poland indicate that a north to south flow um, beyond the west to east flow will increasingly play an important uh, role in uh, supplying landlocked Central and Eastern European states. Simultaneously, new pipeline and LNG capacity in southeastern Europe, coupled with improved interconnections, will contribute to supply security in uh, CESEE countries. And last, uh, last, last slide, um, the expansion of renewable capacity has gained momentum and certainly will facilitate the shift away from dependence on fossil fuels. Um, but don't expect miracles overnight. I mean, this will take a few years until it really has the quantity to really replace um, uh, to a significant degree uh, Russian gas. Um, in the meantime, we will have this price shock that, uh, of course, will weigh in particular on energy intensive industries. Um, as the EU builds up its uh, renewable capacities, uh, it needs to be mindful of new dependencies emerging, and that's, that's the China uh, point I made. And last but not least, and I think this is, uh, this is the sort of the medium to long term for the discussion, the hydrogen capacities um, are quite central for replacing natural gas in industrial processes that re require high temperatures and um, high intensities of energy. Um, this is particularly relevant for Germany and other Central and Eastern European uh, economies in which heavy industries um, are quite, quite important. And so, so, so the way we develop our green hydrogen uh, infrastructure, I think, is an absolutely fascinating uh, subject. Um, and I think it's, it's a subject that deserves a lot further research. Um, there's a lot of different views out there on whether it works or doesn't work. Um, but I think it's, um, it's really fascinating to look further into this, and um, I'm sure that Veronika Grimm will also want, uh, perhaps she will, will talk about it because she works a lot on, on green hydrogen, but I think it's really a great um, 
uh, a great and important topic for the medium to long term. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Guntram. So your old and new head <laughs> combined each other very well to give us a rich insight. And what I've understood is that, I mean, in the short term, we are, work we are making progress in having more integrated gas markets. In the medium term, renewables are doing fine, also maybe creating new dependencies. And in the long term, green hydrogen is, is exactly something for um, the industrial mix, because that's actually, and I will not, I, okay, I will ask one question and then I ask who is going for the next questions, because I would like to know whether in, in Germany you also have a discussion on the industrial mix per se, yeah, which is really highly, which has been using this cheap energy for decades, yeah, and maybe the business model of some of these industry branches are just old school now in the new in the new situation. Yeah. But maybe we can combine this already. I'm looking into the audience. There was so much food for thought that I expect questions coming up. Um, Miss, ooh, okay, that was <laughs> enough for the next hour. Um, okay. Robert Sterer, and then Sonia, and then Axel, and then the next three. Yeah. So thanks very much. Very interesting presentation and talk and, and, and thoughts. I wonder about one aspect, uh, which I'm not sure how, how big that, that problem is, but what you did not mention is that gas is also used directly in some production processes, like fertilizers. Yeah, yeah. So if gas stops, then we well fertilizer production becomes hampered or the rising prices of fertilizers and impact on rising food prices. So I wondered whether you thought also about these impacts and what the implications of that would be. Thanks. I combine three. Sonia? Thank you very much uh, for the rich presentation. I'm based off of Slovakia. Um, so this uh, topic is quite close to my heart. I'm wondering, um, the looming energy cr uh, crunch hasn't returned sort of a revolutionary solution of sorts like the pandemic has a RRF2 of sorts. So I'm wondering what should the common European solution look like to the current energy crisis? A, minding the weak links, which are Slovakia, Czechia, and all of these Central European countries that are so exposed to the current energy crisis, while staying sufficiently um, ambitious. Thank you. Uh, in the last row. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Very much appreciated. I have one question which I was missing a little bit is, I mean, you have shown that there is a lot of, inf a lot of uh, projects going on for new energy, renewable energy. But what I was missing is the infrastructure part, because, I mean, it's nice if we have wind parks in northern Germany. But the question is, how do we get the energy to the south? And in general, I do not see too much progress on the European level to foster the infrastructure. Well, so um, not sure if this uh, if this works, but uh, but I think um, these were excellent uh, questions, and thank you so much for these questions. I mean, uh, on your question on the industrial uh, mix, and I think it connects to the fertilizer, which is sort of part of that that story. Yes, there is a very big debate on what is the right industrial mix, and you know, have we been too uh, too much focusing on very energy intensive intensive industry and and the way this debate was framed at the beginning uh, of the year in, uh, in 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 Germany was certainly um, one that I thought was totally exaggerated. I mean, it was basically saying if we don't have cheap gas, industry is going to collapse, mm -hmm. right? And all of industry and the entire value chains. And uh, I think what we've learned is um, in the last six or eight months is that there is adaptation, right? Our, our economies respond to the market signal. So you have a strong market signal and you respond to that market signal. You, you put mm -hmm. certain parts of your production outside to where energy is cheaper, right? Um, while the rest of the value chain, especially if it's personnel intensive, um, remains in place, right? Um, and so, so there's still this debate, um, and uh, some people close to the unions, um, I guess, would claim that um, 
it is really these very energy intensive parts of industry that uh, that germany needs but in fact it's actually quite low in terms of the number of workers working in these um in these sectors um so so i think what we have actually seen is a huge sort of natural experiment a huge energy repair shock and significant adaptation uh, to that shock um uh, and so i think that suggests that um yes the industrial mix will change but that doesn't mean that value ad uh, value added will disappear i mean it will just be be, be changing and i mean on the fertilizers i haven't studied the fertilizers specifically but of course um you can think about importing fertilizers at at that stage i mean that um you know you don't need to produce the fertilizer in a place where the energy is very expensive i mean then then you can just as well ship it i mean so so i think that that problem should be should be solv solvable on the um on the infrastructure question um yes i mean so i can't do everything in this presentation but i i think i totally agree with you that infrastructure um is is a, is a key uh, um determinant of making the uh, the energy transition to green energy um successful my understanding is that um ele the electricity uh, transporting large amounts of energy through electricity network networks over large distances is not so easy to do um and that's why the green hydrogen is also quite quite a lot discussed because green hydrogen is just so much more energy intensive if you compare a pipeline uh, a hydrogen pipeline with cables i mean you you just get so much more energy through the through the pipeline um then through the cables and so so it, in the end it's a question of also how much how acceptable is it to to citizens right to have pipelines or um cables um uh, over their heads right i mean uh, so so this is this is a big social question at the end of the day um and on the um on the fiscal question and you know do we need a european should we have instead of a doppelwumms a double kaboom from germany and another one from italy and another one from france should we have a european one um I, in a sense it's now a little bit late to have that debate um as a european i would have loved to have actually a european response to it um why well basically to um uh to avoid um uh distortions uh, uh for the single market coming from differences in the support scheme at the same time let me also say this clearly i i think some of the criticism in other parts um in southern and western parts of of europe um towards um the double kavum uh was a bit exaggerated i mean not only had germany one of the biggest shocks given its dependency on russian gas so it had to be a larger support scheme but also the way it was designed um was designed actually in a in a way to really um avoid that this becomes um sort of a burden on the rest of of european consumers through higher um gas consumption i mean so in that sense some of the criticism i thought was a little bit over over going overboard but i think fundamentally yes um uh, it makes sense to have a european response uh, to such a joint common shock mm -hmm. now i could feel the new hat you sitting in berlin already okay thank you for this answer i take three more questions and then i really have to hand over mr governor please herr holzmann also the this mikro, this mikro failed Entschuldigung. <coughs> thanks for the interesting talk uh, uh, three questions number one is on your slide 19 you say uh the uh envisaged uh, enhancement of uh, uh, other sources, sun and winter, uh, able to replace uh, Russian gas in uh, a couple of years or so. Question is, the capacity you have there, is this notional capacity or the usable one? Is it the one which it could produce if wind is turning all the time, sun, or is it really the usable one, which is typically only 10 to 15 percent of the notional one? The second one is, uh, in order to make this happen, if you have it, uh, then uh, gas is typically used for marginal production. And if it is used for marginal production, then the things may not work out. I mean, there may be other uh, further sources uh, which happen there. And the third part is, uh, how much do you think uh, 
how, how many uh, how many uh, wind parks would we need in order to replace a European uh, uh, European energy consumption, which is uh, CO2 intensive, uh, and, or how many square kilometers you need in order to replace it? What would it be there? And third, even if it could be done, do you think it's economical, uh, or do you think we should now give up uh, the law of comparative advantage? Thank you, um, Julia. And I think then I will close. Sorry, please address Wolfram over, uh, Guntram over the coffee. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. So you mentioned in your conclusions that we should also avoid new dependencies, and you showed us the graph with the rising prices of uh, solar panels uh, imported from China. So I wondered what's your judgment? Uh, apparently, our PV industry in Europe was not competitive with China. Now, with these new higher prices, do you see a future for uh, own production in Europe? Well, again, again, a lot of, of super, super good questions. I mean, on the solar, on the solar panel, that's I think a fascinating question. How? Uh, um, uh, I guess my my main point that I wanted to make is that uh, we should avoid um, that global supply comes primarily from one country. I mean, a situation where you have seventy or eighty percent of the market dominated by one country. Um, is a situation where you are uh, vulnerable, right? And where um, uh, this dependency can be weaponized. And so in that sense, I would uh, want us to think about diversification of um, production, um, but that does not mean that we have to home shore and do everything in Europe, right? I mean, this is, I think there's a big confusion in this debate. I mean doesn't mean you have to move production, all production to Europe. It means you have to diversify globally. And you know, there can be other places where you can produce uh, solar panels um, uh, other than, than Europe. Now, you, you also want to produce some of it in, in Europe. You want to have the capacity to do it. You want to have the technology capacity. But I don't think you have to sort of just say you replace Chinese production with, with European one. I think that, that would not be the, the right approach. And, um, and the I mean, on the price, um, so, so the chart showed the increase, not just uh, the increase in the value, uh, in the import value. And so this import value is driven by the price times the quantity. Yeah? So, but the price also went up. And so in that sense, um, uh, you're right that there is a price shock, but there again, I think the price shock will be temporary. I think the production capacities will expand relatively quickly. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, to the to the governor. Um, so my understanding is that these data show usable and not notional capacity, but I, I need to to double check that. Um, on the wind parks, how big? Um, would it be would it have to be um so so this i i haven't looked into or studied um the north sea of course is is not not so bad as a place to to put in uh, um uh, wind parks um uh, norway uh, currently looks into um floatable wind parks um, which is also quite interesting a new technology and whether it's economical, um, that depends very much on what's your baseline assumption about the price of other um, energy. And I think what I showed is you have this very big energy shock and it's actually quite, in the future, it's actually, s I mean, um, a lasting one, right? I mean, it's not sort of disappearing after one or two years. And so in that sense, you have an en a lasting energy price shock and that should make marginally at least some investments more profitable. Um, but in the end, I agree with you. I mean, this should be driven by by the price signal, right? And that's why the buildup of LNG terminals is also quite important, right? Um, Just on the last one, I read it this morning. Ah. Since you're working on uh, water security, uh, China had just concluded yesterday a contract with uh, Qatar for the next 26 years, buying huge amounts which quite likely a lot of their gas will come with a markup plan. Yeah. And if we have uh, ener liquidity gas, I'm sure we would establish here a new dependency there. That's my yeah, I mean, what is fascinating is, of course, the Middle East. Um, 
when you th when you look at the Middle East, they increasingly look to China, and uh, and I think it's very easy to understand why that is the case. I mean, because basically the U.S. Um, is itself a major producer, so they don't import from the Middle East anymore, and Europe is scheduled to get out of uh, fossil fuels over the next twenty years, right? And so well, twenty five. Um, uh, <laughs> well, I mean, the official the, the the official position is 25 uh, to 30 years, right? And so, so in that sense, this changes the geopolitical landscape uh, because people in the Middle East will s look to China, which officially wants to phase out only by 2060, Europe by 2050, some countries in Europe uh, by 2045, um, and so so that has implications also for the relations with the Middle East. And for the marginal production, that's a very, very good point. Um, and um, it's something that um, I think we don't have a solution for the next five to seven years other than LNG um, import. For the next five to seven years, we need, we, I mean, the electricity network needs basically the marginal supplier to be switched on and off. And that can only be, be gas. I mean, gas was the transition fuel. It's been now much, much more expensive, become much, much more expensive. But we don't really have, I don't think we have a very good alternative in the short to medium term. Thank you very much. Contra Molf, that was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Birgit, and thank you, Mr. Wolf, for this uh, insightful keynote. I would now like to ask Bernhard Grossmann and his three panelists to come on stage. We are keen to learn about the short-term responses to inflation and commodity price surges. Bernhard heads the Office of the Fiscal Advisory Council and Productivity Board in the Economic Analysis and Research Department. So, good afternoon to everybody. Can you hear me? Fine. So, first of all, thanks to the organizers of the conference. I'm very happy to be in the position to chair this very interesting session, the first one of today's afternoon. And maybe direct a link to some keywords of Guntram, the wombs, the double wombs, so to say the supporting measures of, of Germany um, stemming from the government. We will deal with this in more detail, so we want to, to come in with an additional perspective, the fiscal dimension of the current crisis. And um, therefore, we will deal with some topics that are directly linked to the fiscal response to the increasing prices at the moment. And therefore, I'm very happy to have these very excellent speakers here at the podium. So we have the... Uh, Baiba Bruce Barde, we have Perma Cholakovic, and we have Zolt Darvash. And uh, we are pretty behind the, ski uh, the time schedule already, but I think it's necessary to, to give a brief introduction um, uh, of, of our pre uh, speakers. And uh, we'll start with you. You are the chief economist at the Lat Latvia's Banka. And uh, there you has been dealing with, uh, let's say, uh, fiscal policy issues for almost 15 years, and currently you are involved in um, analysis of fiscal and sector policies and uh, for assessment of structural reforms, and you're also dealing with the preparations of proposals for fiscal policy decisions. So I think it's uh, very clear that you have a big say in that context. Uh, Belma, you are also working at the Central Bank, at the Central Bank of uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina. You are also chief economist there and you have an experience of more than uh, yeah, 19 years and your current uh, responsibilities are covering the formulation of policy changes with a direct link to the macroeconomic framework and also to monetary policy as well. And you are also involved in, in academia procedure, so you are both a lecturer and an external journal reviewer, so we are also very experienced in that field. And last but not least, Solt, you are 
senior fellow at the Bruegel and uh, senior research fellow at the Covinius University of Budapest. And you had a lot of positions at different central banks as a visiting uh, researcher or uh, also as a staff at the um, Central Bank of Hungary, for, for instance. And yeah, your current focus is directly linked to policy issues. Um, at the moment, for sure, the, the economic fallout from the pandemic or the high inflation in the aftermath of the invasion in Ukraine. But also, you are very well known in the context of the European fiscal framework and the discussion and development of uh, new reform uh, elements of, of this uh, EU framework. So therefore, I think we have a very good um, round of speakers here to deal with these new topics. Um, I think we will sh start our session with a first round of statements that will refer to an overall um, response to the current situation. So, in particular, we will ask how to respond to commodity price surges from a fiscal point of view. We will also ask how to protect most vulnerable people from rising prices, especially in the context of food and energy. And then we would like to ask um, how to avoid social unrest while stepping up sanctions against Russia. And then afterwards, I think it's, uh, you should have the possibility to replicate to each another. And then we will raise a second uh, part of questions, but just um, around the, the, the main topic, how to finance all those measures and, and in initiatives from the fiscal point of view. So just having an eye on the short-term fiscal space on the one hand and on the long-term fiscal sustainability on the other hand. So afterwards, I think we have um, a couple of minutes at least uh, to discuss in a more general way with the whole entire uh, audience. And so now I would like to give the floor to, to Baiba uh, with your slides. Maybe you can use the desk over there and to, to enter into the topic in more detail. Thank you. So let's see, is it working? It's, it is working. Uh, dear, dear guests of the conference, online and here in the, in the hall, so thank you for inviting, and I feel really uh, honored to be one of, among those uh, speakers that are here in the conference, because the conference, I think, gives a lot of uh, food for thought uh, within these two days. So, but turning back to the topic, what we have today about the fiscal response to inflation, that we don't have, oh, okay, may I? <laughs> uh, fiscal response to the um, uh, inflation, the rising commodity prices, is that I will address the, the, the questions uh, line by line, um, just because they, they are, of course, interconnected, but uh, there is a different way of thinking in each of them. So, um, um, what can the fiscal policy do in response to this crisis is that, um, um, and, and the first and straight answer is uh, to protect the vulnerable, not only most vulnerable, but the vulnerable, just because we see that uh, also uh, families of uh, lower middle class are struggling uh, and facing challenges to cover the bills of the fam or, or incoming bills cu currently. So support from the state should not be limited only to most vulnerable, but to the vulnerable. However, the uh, protection against extreme price rise uh, should be maintained, but uh, maintaining the motivation for energy saving. Um, uh, from our uh, perspective, I can say that um, within uh, in the previous heating season, 21-22, uh, uh, the support given to society was uh, almost to cover whole increase in prices, so it did not lead to any consumption decrease. Right now, the decisions are taken in that we have learned our lesson again. We are very good learners from the uh, financial crisis to COVID crisis and to the heating first heating season support. Uh, so right now, the support is given in a way that it's covering ha partly the increase. When it, as it gets extremer, the support gets higher, but up to a certain amount. 
So everything above this amount is on the market price. So if you don't you know, decrease your consumption, so it's up to you. You can do that and still hit uh, plus 30 in your house, but it's not supported by the government. And obviously, the short-term priority is the energy availability. However, the current situation has highlighted the benefits and opportunities of the green policy, of this long-term opportunities within the green policy. So these are the two aspects, uh, three aspects of the fiscal policy response. And obviously, uh, the surge in the energy prices is, is like a headwind for the for the um, uh, for the growth. And uh, this negative impact can be mitigated by the state support. That's what we are doing. And uh, uh, real thanks to Bruegel for this uh, very detailed data on the state support um, uh, in billions and this percent of GDP. We're following that very um, intensively. So uh, refreshing the page very often. Uh, you, you don't uh, update that often as we would like to, but, <laughs> but uh, still it's, uh, it's really important source of, uh, of, uh, of understanding how huge are these support measures from the governments in Europe. Um, but obviously this uh, should be monitored and uh, in, in a way that it's not too much, so it's not fueling inflation, but, uh, but this negative impact, uh, impact of energy prices mitigated by the state support should have some influence on, on, on the inflation and the GDP. Here you see the example of Latvia. We have calculated this with our models. So, in, and, it show, and, and the highest support, of course, is given uh, in 21 and 22, just because there are two heating seasons covered currently. And then we see the deviation from the baseline. So the results impact on inflation and GDP is a deviation from the baseline. So without government support, the inflation that is in Latvia currently at about 22%, well, on average 17, but in 22, the inflation would be almost two percentage points higher without the state support. While if we look at the GDP growth, then the most important, of course, is in 23, when we see shallow and short but recession. So currently, the uh, growth of the real GDP is projected at uh, minus 0 0.2. Without government support, the recession would go to minus 0 0.6. So this is cumulative effect. But still, we have, we have calculated there is a positive and not overheating uh, support from the state government, and that's why we say that we have learned our lesson. So how to protect the most vulnerable? What we can see, especially in rising food and energy prices. So the first, of course, again, straight and forward, direct uh, and targeted benefits to the vulnerable. That including housing benefits. The housing benefits is something that we have in Latvia. If after paying all the expenses related to your housing, you are left with insufficient income, so the threshold, what, you, what we mean with insufficient income, then you can apply for housing benefit. So, and you can use this money for whatever needs you have, but you can apply. So there is no request of your income, but the result after paying all the bills. So that's how we pro protect the more vulnerable. And then there is uh, some commercial banks and uh, bigger enterprises are doing this uh, heating season salary premium. So that's how you uh, support workers with not that high salaries. So it's again, uh, not the most vulnerable, but the most vulnerable. And uh, the third, which uh, sometimes is forgotten, uh, is about to inform society. Because we can see that the people in rural areas really far, those who actually need the most, are less informed. So now th that's why this com information campaign is, is, is really taking, um, taking on right now in Latvia. And if, if the question is asked how to avoid the social unrest, is uh, explain. Explain and be a rea realistic in assessing the threats uh, that is uh, posed uh, from, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from uh, Russia to the whole Europe or globally. And, uh, uh, and, 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 and strengthen again that the geopolitical uh, instability goes together with economical instability. And then when you have explained this and, and realistically explained, then reassure. Reassure that the government, you know this ECB famous uh, sentence of do whatever it takes. So the government will also do whatever it takes to ensure availability and affordability of the energy. And then the third is of course do everything but without fueling inflation because uh, 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 because real income 
of social risk groups if you fuel the inflation through state support is the wrong way to do. Thank you, and I think I stop it here. Right? Thank you for your very clear and very... <laughs> and, and very important inputs for the discussions. Maybe I hang over directly to you yes, for thank the you next input. Thank you. Um, thanks for the organizers for inviting uh, me to this conference. And um, actually, it was quite interesting to hear all the uh, comments from the panelists yesterday and what we've heard from the keynote speaker just before. So it kind of alters the way I'm going to uh, approach this. But I think um, uh, the, the final point that I wish to deliver at the end of my address today, at the end of this panel, is that really there is no uh, single right approach to how to tackle inflation, how to address and how to protect the most vulnerable, because it really depends quite a lot on um, the country specifics and period specifics. And um, I'm going to go uh, very slowly through all these um, uh, key points. So first of all, how big is the most vulnerable in each of the countries that we're talking about? So it, clearly, there are quite big differences between the Western Europe, the Central and Eastern Europe, and the Balkans countries. Um, when I'm talking about the Balkan countries, Bosnia included, um, I think it's, it's fairly safe to say that the situation is, is rather similar. So how big is the most vulnerable? Uh, we're talking about huge income inequality in the vast majority of these countries. If you look only, you don't have to go beyond uh, the data that of the uh, deposit insurance agency, you see that about 98% of the total number of deposits are less than 50,000 km, which is about 25,000 euros. So the average person in the Balkans is in a rather tough position when it comes to disposable income. Um, the demographics characteristics are rather um, unfavorable, and we uh, were talking yesterday about uh, all those trends, brain, dra brain drain, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, if about a quarter of population in each of these countries is retired people with monthly revenues of less than 300 euros in some cases, and if uh, there is a negative uh, uh, natural rate of, of uh, uh, population growth, and if there is a huge outward migration, then it's really questionable how strong the fiscal, policy, uh, fiscal position is currently and what can the government do <coughs> and how on how much revenues they count on in the, in the future. And um, also, when it comes to these um, issues of CPI weights that Governor Seiko mentioned yesterday, uh, they really do matter quite a lot because they reflect the average household consumption in each of the countries. And the differences are really massive. In the Western Europe, for instance, like in, in Austria, the, the uh, weight of food and non-alcoholic beverages is only 11%. In Croatia, it would be around 25%. Then in the Western Balkans, it would be roughly one-third. So one-third of what is earned is consumed on only bare necessities. And if you take into account the disposable income and the price shock, of course, these countries are going to react much more differently compared to, um, compared to uh, countries in Central and Eastern Europe that are uh, members of the, of the EU. Um, so when it comes to electricity, prices and gas prices. Again, the situation is quite different compared to the Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, in the region, we do have uh, strong electricity production from, uh, well, partially renewable, but mostly non-renewable uh, sources of energy from the fossil fuels. Bosnia and Herzegovina specifically is a net exporter of electricity. So our government had some breathing space in the short term for, for being able to keep the electricity prices cap, which was uh, one of the reasons why we did not see that massive spike in electricity prices in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, unlike the, the, the food prices. But that really comes with, uh, uh, with a quite few warnings. So in the medium term, uh, clearly that is going to become less favorable from the perspective of the EU imports from Bosnia and Herzegovina. So once they are uh, taxed more, it's going to be more pricey, so that competitiveness is going to be reduced. And we'll see how the government will quickly transfer to renewable sources of energy. Unfortunately, what the previous keynote speaker was talking about, that is even slower in the Western, and, uh, uh, in the, in the Western Balkan countries. Uh, we, um, 
rely about 80% on uh, on the production from the uh, from the uh, thermal power plants in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And one of the reasons why the governments are so slow in responding and adjusting <laughs> towards the green sources of energy are also uh, the labor market characteristics. A huge number of people are related to the coal mines. So have switching to alternative sources of energy means the unemployment rate is going to increase, the disposable income is going to decrease, et cetera, et cetera, which means less and less and less um, uh, uh, income in the, in the future. Um, so when it comes to uh, direct issues and direct effects of um, stepping up sanctions against Russia, um, again, I don't think it matters that much in the case of Western Balkans. Maybe in the case of Serbia, it could be slightly different. But the rest of countries, not that much, because the trade connections with Russia are rather low. We do not depend on gas, natural gas imports. Only about 5% of uh, total electricity, uh, total uh, energy consumption uh, pre-pandemic was uh, from the natural gas. And those are mainly uh, the capital and some industrial areas in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And the amount that we're importing from Russia is on annual level as a country is equivalent to a suburbia of Vienna. It's really very, very small. So the differences are, are, are quite different, and if you, quite, quite large, and if uh, there is a willingness to step up sanctions against Russia, there's nothing but political sentiment that is preventing governments in the Western Balkans to do that. Um, even before, uh, before the war in Ukraine, before uh, everything started happening in, in March this year, uh, we, our exports to Russia were less than uh, a a 0.5 percent uh, percentage points of total exports, and imports were less than 3 percent. Now it's even even smaller. So, no major FDIs from Russia. Uh, we are not dependent on import of, of natural gas. So it's merely the political sentiment on how fast the governments would uh, step up the sanctions. But I would not expect them to be. Um, to, to cause some social riots, as, as we would say. So I might stop here, and we might discuss later uh, if there are some questions from the audience. Thank you. Well, thank you for your <laughs> additional thoughts. <laughs> so may I ask you for your views to share them with us? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Bernard. And first of all, s thank you very much for inviting me here. It's really an honor and pleasure to participate in this uh, insightful discussion. And I also thank my, my colleagues in the panel who already raised a number of uh, very pertinent issues with which I, I share a lot. So instead of repeating with many things I agree, let me try to complement by offering one thought for, for each of the three questions which was, which was raised. So the first one was, was about fiscal policy, what it can do in the, in the short term. And, and what I would like to emphasize is that surprise inflation is very good for fiscal policy because most of the tax revenues are indexed to income or consumption. So if income and consumption goes up because of high inflation, then tax revenues suddenly increase. While at the same time, previous borrowing uh, has the fixed rate which was, which was uh, borrowed in the, in the past. So even the central banks tighten more and more <coughs> throughout the world, that only impacts the marginal cost of, of additional debt, but all the past debt is very, very cheap and enjoys an extremely negative real interest rate. So, so in the short term, even though governments spend a lot of money on supporting households and companies <coughs> alike, uh, still there is uh, a fiscal space, space to do that. And we can look at, for example, uh, forecast for, for public debt or, or across, across the world, and we do see that all these forecasts are forecasting a lower ratio of public debt to GDP, exactly because of the, of the surprise inflation. So I think in the, in the short term, uh, we can discuss the medium and long term in the next round, but at least in the, in the short term, uh, I don't see major fiscal um, constraints. Now, the second question was how to support vulnerable households uh, amid of rising food and, and energy prices. And again, I, <coughs> I very much agree with Baiba, for example, but you said that, that price volatility sh could, be, could be eliminated or, or smoothed out, uh, but the price signal should remain there. 
And I think that should be indeed the, the underlying fundamental principle of, of support to households and, and companies, that the price signal is extremely important. I mean, as Guntram mentioned in, in his remarks, the German industry was, did a remarkable adjustment. You know, half a year ago, we read many articles saying, oh, it, uh, the whole German industry will collapse if, if, if gas uh, supply from Russia stops and, and gas prices skyrocket. If you look at you know, the latest, for example, industrial production for September, there was even a, an increase in, across the Eurozone, about 1% increase. Uh, and throughout the summer, I mean, industrial production remained more or less flat. There was even, even a minor increase. So even though gas, consum gas consumption industry went down by about 15, 20%, industrial production didn't even, there was a slight increase. So, so I think the price signal is absolutely essential. And this principle also should apply to, to, to households. Now, vulnerable households should be supported. In my view, the, certainly the best support is, is lump sum support. I mean, saying that, you know, households get, I don't know, 100 euros or 200 euros a month for, for, to pay for the, for the higher bill. So I'm also a little bit <coughs> at odds with the German, German support scheme, uh, which said that, as you said, Guntram, 80% uh, of past consumption will be at the subsidized rate and the rest will be subject to, to, to the market rate. Now, it's very good that the 20% will be subject to market rate, but this support of, for 80%, if I understand well, goes to everyone those who live in one, one bedroom apartment and also those who live in, in a, in a six-bedroom big house and, and consuming a, a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of energy. Uh, <coughs> so I think the, the, the support for the vulnerable indeed should be very targeted, ideally as lump sum, not related to past consumption, in order to foster uh, as great uh, reduction in consumption as, as, as possible. And yes, in Europe there are there's lots of vulnerable people, but luckily, most of the European population is, is, I mean, have a decent living standards. And even though, yes, higher energy prices and higher inflation in general reduces the purchasing power of, um, <coughs> of, of, of salaries, um, still most Europeans would be able to uh, <coughs> do more to reduce consumption. And on the third question, uh, how to avoid social unrest while stepping up sanctions against Russia? Let me approach this from a, from a different angle. Uh, whether we need to step up sanctions against Russia further or not. And the reason I'm asking that question is that we are doing some research with, with some of my, my colleagues when we are looking at detailed, detailed trade data. Not from Russia, because Russia stopped uh, publishing trade data, but we look at what the EU reports, what China reports, what the US reports, Turkey reports, and so on. So we look at mirror statistics. And we do see that sanctions work. Sanctions work in a sense that those products which are sanctioned, I mean, Western nations impose a lot of sanctions on, on high technology and, and various kinds of other infrastructure exports to Russia. Those exports to Russia collapsed a lot, uh, and not just from, from those countries imposing sanctions, but also from, from China, Turkey, and India. Um, <coughs> I mean, the total trade collapsed a lot, total exports to Russia collapsed a lot, but those products which were, which were under sanction collapsed, collapsed even more. And if you look at Russian exports of non-fossil fuels, we also see a major reduction there. So it does indicate that Russia already has major difficulties in, in producing and, and exporting uh, goods like <coughs> cars or, or whatever other uh, equipment uh, and, and manufactured products, products they are doing. So already the, the sanctions already had, in my view, a major impact on, on, uh, on the productive capacity of the Russian economy. Yes, of course, we can speed up sanction further, but I think already san existing sanctions are already effective. <coughs> and you know, I mean, the, one of the most important sanctions, I mean, the, the ban of, of first crude oil and then refined petroleum imports from Russia to the EU, is still to come in December and, and February next year, which will <coughs> cut a lot the, the revenues that, that uh, uh, Russia can get from, from selling fossil fuels. So I think already the existing set of sanctions are very effective and inflict a major damage on the, on the Russian economy. So don't really think that we need to step up sanctions a lot. We might, of course, do. I'm nothing else of that, but I think already what we have is very, very important. 
And on the, on the social unrest, question, uh, unrest issue, I think we should explain very clearly to, to the population that the, the sanctions are not the most important driver of energy prices. Now look at gas prices. I mean, uh, as, as Birgit, you already mentioned, Russia already cut gas supply well before the war started. Europe hasn't introduced any sanction on gas so far. There have a lot of discussion of a price cap or whatever, but hasn't introduced anything. So, so the gas price increase, first of all, the gas price increase in 2021 was higher than 2022. So gas prices increased more last year when the war has not yet started than, than in this year when, when we have the war and we have, have, have hasn't introduced sanctions. So, <clears throat> so clearly it's not the sanctions that are driving uh, the gas prices. And if you look at oil prices, again, oil prices increased more last year than this year. And the EU oil sanctions are just coming into force in December. Uh, and, and in February next year. <coughs> so <coughs> we can talk a lot what, what drives uh, 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 electricity prices and gas prices and, and oil prices. Certainly the war had an impact, I don't deny that. But what I would like to emphasize that energy prices increased even more last year than, than this year. So <coughs> the war is not the only reason for that. And I think it should be explained very clearly to, to the people <coughs> that that look, it's not the sanctions which are causing the, the high prices, but for example, Russia's unilateral uh, decision to cut gas supply to, to Europe. So let me stop here, thank you. Yes, thank you, thank you. <laughs> well, we have already touched a lot of topics within the fiscal dimension, I would say, and uh, for sure the government will have to play a very important role to deal with the crisis and to, to support the especially vulnerable people in, in, in our countries and for sure to support the green transition as well because we have this second very important channel to react on the current crisis. But for sure it's necessary to have the financial power to do so and that's the, the second round. Uh, I would like to deal with this, this question of how we can support uh, in, in the right way and in, in to that extent that is necessary without uh, losing our fiscal sustainability uh, in the long term and without uh, to get too much pressure on our fiscal balance mm -hmm. at the moment. So maybe we can start once again this, this round and for instance uh, you may also replicate to the to the point of the others uh, if there is something that you want uh, to say in that context. Thank you. Okay, I will first address the, the issue of fiscal space. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, where to find the where to find money for that, uh, for, for, for the state support? Is that um, um, our our analysis of the COVID support shows that uh, uh, this famous 3T, temporary, ta uh, targeted, temporary, and tailored support is something that costs less. So we we will look, look through this um, COVID support measures and uh, replicated that to energy support me measures, and it is always the targeted support is always costs for the budget less than untargeted or helicopter money. It's, it's always cost much, much more. So the second, uh, where to get the fiscal uh, space for long-term green policy, it's the next, gen next generation EU and the RRF um, implementation of the uh, resilience facility. We know that uh, imp implementation of these projects has been postponed year by year. So we uh, waited for huge projects in 2020 already when the next gen was announced, then in 2021 and, and, and RRFs hasn't really started yet. So this is one of the opportunities that hasn't been used but should be used while the deadline hasn't been extended. So what we are creating is some kind of bottleneck in the upcoming years in 23 to 26. But still, uh, I think uh, this is the this is the source to be used. However, in general to say is that um, the, 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 the fiscal rules, what we have had so far, um, uh, facilitate the fact that uh, during uh, this counter cyclical <laughs> pol uh, policy, fiscal policy was good in or is good in down, down, down times or when the recession is there. Then it's a counter cyclical fiscal policy. However, when then was this uh, growth of economy, 
the counter cyclical fiscal policy hasn't been that efficient. So it's, it's not the short, but the medium term and long term to think again that uh, this counter cyclical fiscal policy of good and bad times should be actually preserved. And let's see what the, what the um, uh, new fiscal rules, whether they will be more efficient in, in delivering this result or, or as usually. Thank you. Elma? Um, yeah, actually I'm going to touch upon what Salt mentioned that people should be very carefully communicated that the gas prices are not that what is driving the inflation and, and everything majority, especially in the Central and Eastern um, country. In, in, in Bosnia and vast majority of countries in the Balkans, uh, there, is a, there is a strong evidence of very strong um, of pains that we're already feeling from the tightening labor market. Uh, there is not enough labor, uh, skilled labor force, and uh, that is pushing wages very high. Even before the, the crisis started, even before we started, uh, experience, uh, the, the, we started experiencing the effects of um, war in Ukraine and, and uh, disruptions in international markets. So that is definitely reducing the competitiveness and it's pushing the inflation and everything. So when I say that um, the governments are really in, in a very difficult position to do something from the perspective of the structure of the economy, of the, of the, of the, of the demographics, um, it's, it's really, um, there is no country, no matter how rich it is, no matter how large fiscal space there is, if you have to support a uh, very prolonged inflationary shock. This is not transitory, this is here to stay. It's been here for a year, it's probably going to be here for, for several more years. So structural reforms are something that is more suitable, in my opinion, in these situations, rather than uh, one, uh, one uh, time stops. The governments, in their infinite wisdoms, tend to, um, tend to um, throw helico helicopter money. We sure saw that in Bosnia. We had general elections, so there were one-time increases in, in page, pension payouts, et cetera, et cetera, but that's really one time. You can't help too much to an average person that is living at the, at the brink of poverty by uh, giving them uh, once what, 50 or 100 euros per, per month. That's not going to resolve their problems. So the problems are going to be there to stay for the next several years. So the structural reforms are really the only way forward. Uh, including the, the transformation of the, of the energy uh, sector towards more green and more reliable. Of course, that lasts, that, that is a long-term project. So um, governments, in some cases, based on the uh, world latest uh, issue of the world, the economic outlook of the IMF, uh, the, the fiscal space is narrow and is shrinking in vast majority of cases. In Bosnia and Herzegovina, it's not. We even run a, a surplus, and that's not because our government is uh, super wise or, or uh, knows how to handle uh, finance better than others. We were just running uh, uh, the budget under provisional financing for political reasons for the past uh, year, so the, the money was not spent as it should be to stabilize the economy. But it also depends on uh, how much space they will, they're going to have on the structure of the, of the debt. Uh, Bosnia and quite a lot of countries in the Western Balkans still do have relatively large fraction of con uh, concessional uh, borrowing, borrowing under concessional terms from supranational institutions. So that is putting them in slightly better position than if they had to tap into international markets and borrow to finance. But um, the space, the, the general, uh, the best, well, the general wisdom in such cases, in cases when you have narrow fiscal space, would be stop borrowing and uh, um, and and uh, uh, restructure your expenditures. But as we heard yesterday during the panels, it's really much easier said than done. You can't expect people to sit patiently and wait and promise them that things are going to be better if they could only you know hold for three to four, five more years. Thank you. May I ask you for the next? Yes, thank you. So, um, so let me focus on on the medium term fiscal fiscal uh, outlook. So I think in the in the short term there is no big issue because investors well understand that when there is a big shock, then you know it can happen that there is a jump, let's say, in the public debt to GDP ratio, as it happened during the global financial crisis or or during the during the COVID crisis. But if there is a credible medium-term fiscal framework in place, 
then this one-time job jump in the debt ratio would uh, be gradually worked down in, uh, in later years. Now, <coughs> the current situation is a, is a kind of compounded situation by both the pandemic and, uh, and, uh, and the Russian invasion of Ukraine because government spent a lot of money during the pandemic. Uh, then as we were coming out at last from the pandemic and, and the <coughs> economy started to regain strength, then came the, the Russian invasion <coughs> with all its adverse, adverse uh, impacts. So we are facing a kind of double shock, which now lasts for, for, for three years now at, at least. <coughs> and I, I'm afraid, uh, Berma, you are right, that inflation is, is here to stay for, for longer. Perhaps the, the energy price shock might, might fade out uh, <coughs> as, as uh, all of these base effects will, will eliminate and eliminate it. And again, we, we already saw falling energy prices recent months. But we see more and more increase in underlying core inflation, <coughs> uh, which will be much more difficult to, to reverse and to, and to, to slow down. <coughs> and certainly it will have a major impact on what public finances will then be able to do. So, <coughs> so what to do in the, in the medium term? Let me refer to the, to the European Commission's recent proposal on, on reforming the fiscal rules, which was a Big, big positive surprise to me. <laughs> First of all, I think the Commission uh, made, I mean, <coughs> a very fundamental uh, reform proposals, many of which uh, were also proposed by many colleagues, including uh, Brugge, Brugge authors. <coughs> but there is one aspect of the proposal that I particularly like, <coughs> is that they have basically a 15-year uh, forward-looking element. So the proposal says that either in the next four or seven years, the, the adjustment should be done, again, with modified indicators, uh, instead of a kind of structural budget balance, it would mu much more focus on, 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 on uh, an indicator of public expenditures. But it says that even beyond this four or seven year period, they will continue the, pro to the projections under unchanged policy for a subsequent 10 year period, and they look at how the debt ratio is expected to, to decline. Now, this is an inherently difficult exercise because you know what growth rate, what interest rate to expect, um, <coughs> whether any other stochastic shocks might, might come or not. But what I very much like is the, is the basic framework looking ahead for 15 years because you know, if you have, let's say, four or seven years to do the adjustment, and after that, you have to assume unchanged fiscal policy, and this will, this will need to put the debt ratio on a de declining uh, trajectory. Uh, that's, I would say, a very, I think, useful, useful framework for, for assessing fiscal policy uh, sustainability. And <coughs> this will be, have to done, be done by every country. Perhaps I can believe that many countries didn't look forward that much. Now they will have to do, they have to, they can't really trick the numbers because, again, the, the rule is that after the four or seven year adjustment period, no change in fiscal policy is, is possible. <coughs> well, I don't know what is the chance of this proposal being, being adopted, but I, at least I think this, this very strong focus on, on a 15 year long horizon gives, uh, I would say, a lot of useful tools for, for fiscal policy makers to be able to design fiscal policies that are sustainable. So I very much hope that at least this element will be uh, accepted and uh, implemented. Thank you. Well, I think there was a lot of important uh, things that have already been mentioned here. I took note of, of many of them because we are now in the process uh, in Austria of uh, formulating our recommendations to the Ministry of Finance. And so there was a lot of good input that we can also include in our uh, yeah, recommendations as well. But. Um, I think it's a good point of time to, to enter in a more general discussion and to, to take all the, the uh, yeah, comments and questions from the floor and also from the, the chat room if there is something. Uh, so please don't hesitate to, to raise your hands and to, to be involved in our discussion. <laughs> so there is a, a woman here and, and the mm -hmm. second Hi. one is over there. My question is, primarily to Belma. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about the price cap for electricity. 
Um, can you just maybe explain a bit how we introduced it? Um, because for me, the question is uh, that, okay, it helps to reduce, uh, to uh, contain inflation. So you, you mentioned this, and we know the same is true for France, for example. Mm -hmm. So for me, the question, why others don't do it? Is, are there any major drawbacks in this policy, any difficulty in implementing it? Because it seems quite obvious this is how you contain inflation. Thanks. Yes. Are we going to pick up more? Uh, the second here? one it was the man over there, please. And then Franz Nauschnick on the left hand side. Hi, I'm Dubravko Mihaljak from the BIS. I have a very simple question. If somebody could explain the pros and cons of taxing extra profits of uh, utilities. After all, of many of these companies are state-owned or have large state ownership uh, share and they are to say the least not really run uh, most efficiently in normal times uh, so what are the pros and cons of, of this tax not that this kind of revenue is uh, sorely needed i agree uh, and i think uh, jolt for bringing up the VAT uh, money machine <laughs> into the picture because governments uh, are really uh, afloat right now to, with the tax revenue from inflation. Thank you, and Franz Nauschnick, and then we can start the first round of answers. Uh, my question is related. We are sanctioning Russian oil and gas. Would it not be economically more efficient to have uh, import tariffs, EU import tariffs on Russian oil and gas? Because this would allow some uh, income which then could be redistribu redistributed to uh, EU member countries. Import tariffs on Russian oil and gas. So thank you for your very interesting and important questions. So who wants to answer or to try to find an answer to those questions? I might, I might start because mm. it's quite yeah. quite an easy and, and direct one related to uh, why shouldn't everybody cap electricity prices. Um, it depends really what's the structure of the economy and how who actually owns the electricity production can in, in, in the country. In the Western Balkans, it's still state-owned in, in, in the vast majority of cases. In the case of Bosnia-Herzegovina, it. Uh, electro distribution, that's the, the name of the conglomerate, consists of the mines, uh, <laughs> nine or ten mines, plus the electricity production company. So electricity production company is always in surplus and these are always in deficit. So net effects, they look okay, but when you start on picking the, the characteristics, that it, there are quite a lot of uh, worms in there. So if it's owned by the state, then uh, they can, in order to preserve social peace primarily, bearing in mind the disposable income and the fact that we're, again, returning to the fact that we are in the process of very persistent inflationary shock, which is changing the long-term consumption patterns in the country. They can keep the electricity, uh, especially for the households, at relatively uh, flat level. What they are considering to do now is introducing uh, brackets for consuming different quantities of electricity. So they would say up to a certain uh, level of electricity consumption, you're going to pay this price and then it's going to be uh, uh, stepped up. Um, is it sustainable in the long run? No, it's not. We know how the subsidies work and they always backfire, especially in the, in the medium to long run. So this is really not something that is sustainable. You can distort prices to a certain extent, but then if you start, um, for instance, uh, aligning more with what the com country committed itself to uh, all those uh, um, uh, things that are negotiated with uh, an uh, international en uh, uh, energy agency, on swift transmission and, and um, moving and stepping away from, uh, uh, from fossil fuels, uh, the country will have to, at least in the initial period, to import electricity. And when you start importing electricity, there are no subsidies from the country. Then you will have to pay the market price, and that's going to increase even more the, uh, the inflationary pressures. So 
in very short, why they don't do that more often, because it's not the luckiest solution that there is, and it really depends on what's the structure of electricity production uh, uh, in, in the country itself. Thank you. Who wants to deal with the question of pros and cons connected to the extra profits, taxing extra profits? Mm. I don't know whether it's uh, pros and cons, but uh, just to comment on this, on the previous question, according to our information, there are actually rather many countries that do that. There is the there is yeah. a special for electricity. There is a price cap for especially for house uh, house. Um, for house for inhabitants, not for the enterprises always. But in Latvia, we have actually both. Uh, so and the Bruegel information also tells us, and the I I internal uh, central bank information, we can see that uh, measure used quite oftenly. And regarding the taxing windfalls, um, uh, wind profit, is that uh, I would say it's a better than the VAT reduction. So if, uh, if the budget needs, uh, needs to get money, then better taxing uh, extra profits. And I, I would certainly agree that, uh, that uh, in many cases it's the state-owned enterprises. So it's about uh, uh, higher dividends to be, or less dividends to be paid uh, in, in, in the budget. But as for the private sector, when there is really extra profit from, um, it just happens. It's a, it's a yeah, additional unexpected profit, then there is something uh, you can share the burden. And it's certainly better than the VIT. Yeah. Would you like to yes, add something? Yes, thank you. I also respond briefly to, to the two or three questions. I, <coughs> I very much agree with you, Belma, that this price caps uh, on electricity or anything else is not sustainable in the, in the long, long term. So any price cap essentially increases demand Mm -hmm. And what we, this is what we need the least. I mean, uh, so what we need is, is somehow bring demand supply conditions settle in the medium term at a price level, which, which is, I would say, not very bad for, for, the, for the economy, because we are certainly also competing with, with producers in China, US, and elsewhere where energy is, energy is cheaper. But, you know, we are in the particular situation in Europe whereby we import a lot of energy from abroad. And we and we need to work on that. We need to re reduce that. And the best thing is the is the price signal, which can regulation can also help. But but price signal is is the very forceful for for signal. So again, for short term, especially for for smoothing out highly volatile uh, uh, prices, I I would see a rationale uh, for for such price caps. But but in the medium term, and the medium term already comes in a, in a couple of quarters. Uh, I see the rationale for that is relatively low. Now, on the, on the question on, on, on a tariff on Russian oil and, 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 and gas, I mean, Guntam would be the best person to answer because he, he has long, long uh, argued for that. Uh, <coughs> now, it did not happen, but what did, did happen is that, for example, without any uh, measure on Russian gas, you know, it was cut by Russia by, by 80% in a uni unilateral way. So we could not try to, to show our muscle and, and impose a, a tariff or, or whatever on that. It's already mostly gone. Uh, so not much, not much would, uh, would, would, would come out of that. Now, certainly for oil, that would have been an option. But uh, <coughs> yeah, there was a political decision not, not to go there. And again, <coughs> if we, if we just, just on, the, on, the, on the downside, so if we would have gone for that, <coughs> again, Russia might have so to, to reduce uh, oil supply as well to Europe. Again, Russia, I think, will face major difficulties in reorienting its, its gas supply as well. We see that China, India buys much more now than, than uh, half a year ago, but there are limitations on, on how much gas uh, or oil supply can, can go there. Also, the, <coughs> the, the embargo on, on, on prohibition of insurance of European and, and UK insurance of, of tankers which carry Russian gas, which will also come into force soon. That will be also a major blow for the ability of Russia to shift production or, or sales away from, from Europe. It can increase a little bit more, but certainly not the, not the whole amount. Uh, <coughs> so all in all, yes, the tariff would have made sense. This was not the choice. And I think we need to see what will happen by, by February next year, when also 
the embargo on, on imports of Russian refined petroleum will come into place, how much Russia will be able to sell that as well. My guess is not that much, so that's, <coughs> that's why my prediction is that it will severely hit Russian revenues from selling oil. Thank you. I think we are pretty in line with the time schedule, and I hope that everybody that had the, uh, the willingness to join our discussion has already taken the opportunity to do so. And so, once again, thank you for your really uh, important and very interesting inputs to our discussion. And um, we should start now the the coffee break, and I think the bell will ring when we should move back to our seats for the second session in this afternoon. So thank you once again, and bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Now it's time for one of the masterminds of the CEI to take the stage, uh, Julia Wertz. She heads the Central, Eastern, and Southeastern Europe section here at the UNB, and she and her team have organized this conference. So I think we should give her and her team a big hand. And together with her three distinguished panelists, uh, she's going to discuss the topic addressing long-term supply challenges via structural policies and green transition. The floor is yours, Julia. Thank you, Ingrid, for this uh, very kind introduction. <laughs> but I think this conference is the joint effort of many people, um, and I'd like to thank them all. Now, we've discussed many aspects of the challenges that we currently face of the high commodity and uh, energy prices and thus elevated inflation. And just before the break, the session focused on the short-term responses that we can give to stabilize again our economies. Now, in this section, session, we will take more a structural look at long-term policies, uh, policies that would support the transition or the shift towards more resilient and sustainable economies, with a focus on the EU again and on Central and Eastern Europe. Just as, an, as a short warm-up for the session, the EU's Green Deal has actually, and uh, uh, for me this was a surprise in a sense, has actually been presented almost three years ago. So in December 2019, and defined targets that would ensure a climate neutral European Union by 2050. But less than a year later already, the, in September 2020, the 2030 climate target plan, plan raised the ambition level even further to 2030, as you can deduct from the title of the plan. Now, ambitious targets at the time would already have implied quite a fast restructuring of the EU economies. But now, what comes on top of this is supply chain disruptions following the pandemic, related price shocks, and uh, the Russian war in Ukraine. Um, so all this has actually um, meant that the structural shift must now take place almost immediately. And this is not, I may say, primarily out of environmental concerns, but it is also uh, very urgent for geostrategic and economic reasons to do so. So in order to achieve this, the Commission has then uh, proposed the Repower EU plan, which was already mentioned today, uh, which should make Europe independent from Russian fossil fuels well before 2030. But the question is, does this now actually accelerate our green transition? And how can we make sure that we build on the right, on the future fit technologies when we substitute, for example, uh, pipeline gas from Russia by LNG gas from somewhere else? Partly we have discussed this already. Um, but in this session, we will discuss more the geostrategic options the EU has, the role of NGEU funds, in particular the recovery and resilience facility, and how to set the right incentives today for a truly sustainable economy tomorrow. So it's a great pleasure to welcome three highly knowledgeable speakers on this issue to discuss all this. I'm particularly honored to welcome Professor Veronika Grimm on my left from the Friedrich Alexander Universität in Erlangen-Nürnberg. But I think she is 
more, better known than for her university. <laughs> she is known for her role uh, in the, as a member of the German, Economic, German Council of Economic Experts, uh, which, where she is a member since 2020. And as such, what Veronika thinks and says has a strong impact on German politics. So it's also not unimportant for European politics, I would say. <laughs> in addition, uh, Veronika is also active in numerous committees and advisory boards. And I refer you to the online short bio to uh, follow all the advisory boards uh, she is in. Uh, and uh, just would like to say that in her research, she focuses on energy markets, energy market modeling, behavioral economics as well, social networks, auctions, and market design. Needless to say that she has published in the leading academic journals. It is also my great pleasure to welcome Elena Baltseva, and I hope we can see her on the screen. Hi, nice to see you, Elena. Uh, thank you for joining us online from Sweden today, so thus reducing your carbon footprint um, for this conference. So Elena is an associate professor at the Stockholm School of Economics, and her research interests include political economy, energy and resource economics and industrial organization. Before Elena joined the Stockholm Institute of Transition Economics, uh, she has worked as an assistant professor at the University of Copenhagen, and she holds a PhD from the Stockholm School of Economics. And I'm also very happy to introduce my colleague Thomas Reininger as the third speaker in the session. Thomas joined our bank already in 2000. He is a senior principal economist in the economics department, uh, more specifically in the section uh, dealing with the CZ countries, um, including Turkey and Russia. And uh, prior to um, working for the bank, he has also collected several years of experience at large international commercial and investment bank and at an international auditing company. Thomas holds a PhD in economics from the University of Vienna. And his areas of expertise, I should add, include macrofinancial stability analysis and systemic risk, risk issues, safe assets and the EU budget, as well as energy and climate economics, always, of course, with a focus on the analysis of policy approaches in each area. So having introduced the three excellent speakers, may I now uh, ask Veronica to take the floor first to give us the big picture as an introduction to this session. OK, I brought a few slides. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. Um, and I think you will switch to the slides. <laughs> ah, perfect. They will come. Here they come. Perfect. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I will give a brief introduction and I will um, build on a graph that you already saw today. <laughs> it does not work. Ah, now it comes. Um, you saw this graph already uh, today. Um, and I will um, uh, try to illustrate um, uh, that um, what the transformation plan uh, was before the crisis, um, uh, the the plan to uh, become climate neutral in the EU by 2050, in, the, um, in Germany, for example, by 2045. Um, it was always said this decade um, will decide whether we can achieve climate neutrality. And this is still true, but it has become much more difficult um, just because we see this... Oh, now it's... Um, <laughs> ah, it's a little bit slower than, do you do it or do I do it? <laughs> you do it. <laughs> okay, I had first one time. Yeah. Okay, now it's there. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it is now much more difficult because we have a gas price tsunami happening uh, that was initiated by the Russian war of aggression against Ukraine um, that drove uh, the gas price quite high um, because um, of supply reduction, basically, also before, already before the war. And um, uh, the gas price is very high, and uh, futures tell us that the gas price will not come down before 24. Um, so this is basically the picture we are facing. Uh, gas price is very high in this quite short period, and thereafter the gas price will stay 
higher uh, than, than uh, we had it historically, just because we have to substitute from Russian gas that was cheaper uh, to uh, LNG uh, that we buy on the world market. And this means also, as you see in this graph, that uh, the gas price in Europe and uh, also in Asia will uh, stay higher than the gas price in the United States. Also, this uh, will be a challenge to our competitiveness. Um, the attention has now shifted uh, from uh, the comparatively distant uh, goal of climate neutrality um, to the immediate emergencies. Um, but the crisis, of course, is also an opportunity. For example, energy efficiency has really been boosted. There are a lot of measures in energy efficiency and progress um, is historic in a way. Um, we will uh, see that climate neutral hydrogen, um, which has been discussed already f before the crises, um, will become profitable much earlier uh, because you see it here, that's uh, a stylized illustration, but basically there will be a cost regression as we scale up hydrogen production and hydrogen imports. And of course, if the gas price remains higher than it was before, then um, it is attractive to switch to hydrogen earlier. Um, and of course, uh, there's also a strong incentive and strong pressure to um, expand renewables uh, much faster. However, companies uh, face um, really pressure because their transformation plans are under pressure. Hydro um, gas was uh, thought as a bridge technology in order to get into a future, into a climate neutral future based, for example, on hydrogen or on electrification. And gas in this intermediate period will be much more costly and so uh, there's a lot of pressure uh, on firms uh, there's also shortages in materials and skilled labors which will um, accelerate basically the pressure and we have to deal uh, with these challenges um, not only um, in the energy intensive sectors such as the steel industry or chemical industry but also in other industries of course uh, this gas price tsunami will uh, cause really difficulties uh, to cope with the situation and that was why um, the government in Germany for example and in many other countries have taken measures in order to alleviate the pressure from these very high prices and what um, happened in Germany is now I wait until it reacts. Mm. <laughs> no. no. Um, what uh, has been done in Germany is um, that the gas cost um, is established at uh, the new normal. So this is the black line here, basically. So um, the uh, measures, the gas price break in Germany uh, does not um, subsidize uh, firms and households such that they have the historic cost level, but uh, it subsidizes them so that they uh, have to bear already uh, the cost level that is to be um, anticipated due to future prices. So that's basically uh, the mechanism. Um, and the second, um, um, and the second um, aspect is that it is not subsidizing prices directly, um, but uh, the subsidies are lump sum, basically, uh, so that the incentive to save gas uh, is still there. And this is, from a European perspective, I think very desirable because um, then the incentive to save gas <coughs> is there and also saving gas also um, drives prices down at the wholesale market uh, because um, there's just less aggregate demand. Uh, so this is um, a property of the mechanism that we found very important. So the subsidies uh, uh, that have to be paid for this is basically um, the grey um, area here in the graph. And of course, we can affect this gray area, the need to pay subsidies by measures to, um, to increase the energy supply, to in particular the gas supply, in order to bring the gas price down and to um, decrease um, gas demand. And this would mean that um, the need to subsidize households and firms also is um, reduced. Now I try to switch the slide again. <laughs> Let's see. Whether it reacts. Hmm. Yeah, no. 
Okay, so by uh, measures to, to, to increase demand, basically to, uh, to procure gas at the world market, um, by measures to activate all accessible, uh, all um, available um, power plants in the electricity markets um, in order to reduce um, the power production from gas. Um, and of course, by energy efficiency measures, we can drive down the gas price, and this means that we have to pay less subsidies also to households and to firms in um, the context of these gas price break measures and or other measures in Europe. Um, now, um, of course, um, there is um, a the necessity uh, to cooperate in Europe, and in particular, if we uh, procure gas at the world market, we have a severe problem because, of course, the um, providers of gas they don't want to uh, sign contracts for say 10 years, but Europeans don't want to buy gas for much more than 10 years, for 10 to 15, and I think that few solutions to this problem. One could, for example, uh, contract without destination clauses. So worldwide, of course, there will be a demand for gas um, much longer than those 10 years. If we contract without destination clauses, the gas could be available to others that switch from coal to gas at that time. Um, or we combine gas procurement with hydrogen procurement so that we switch um, after uh, 10 years more or less from gas to hydrogen, either to blue or green hydrogen, so that in the end, in the long run, we are uh, having contracts on green hydrogen. And I think this is also a very good idea because there are many countries that today sell LNG, but tomorrow prepare already to sell green hydrogen um, on a large scale. So this is, um, I think, very important. And I think it's also, also important not to damage, in the context of this crisis, the European institutions that um, will enable us to transform to a climate neutral future. This is the um, electricity um, common market. Uh, which is under pressure because uh, everybody is uh, talking about the merit order um, system that is not working. Um, I think um, what is the problem is that gas prices are so high and not that the merit order in principle has, does not work. Um, it is very risky to um, fire, um, to, to use coal-fired pla pla um, coal power plants for long term because then, of course, the emission prices will go up and there will be, be, there will be a debate on the emission trading system which more or less guarantees that emissions go down. So, uh, in, for example, in Germany, the sectors that are under the EU ETS, they uh, just... Um, accomplished their targets and uh, the other sectors did not. So I think this is very important that we, um, th that we manage uh, to keep our uh, emission trading system and the um, electricity common market and also that we expand network capacity for electricity and for hydrogen uh, together in Europe and fast because if renewable energy carriers are not available at production sites of industry, for example, in Europe, then, of course, reinvestment in climate neutral um, industrial plants will not uh, be beneficial. So this is a very important um, issue. I think we also have to care for um, the other dependencies, not only in the context of energy, we have strong dependencies, but also in the context of, for example, raw critical raw materials, we have strong dependencies, for example, from China, and I think we have to address it rapidly. It's not um, so much seen, and uh, the discussion is not so much aware of this, but without all these um, input factors, we will not be able to um, get our uh, green transformation ready. And we also have to see, and this is my last point, we have also have to see that we are in a global competition in the US. Um, there is the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Um, passed, um, um, which includes um, billions of tax incentives and subsidies for the expansion of renewable energy sources. And this is good uh, for global climate protection, but this also puts pressure on Europeans in order to accelerate the transformation, because of course um, it will um, mean that uh, there is a competition for supply factors and production capacities 
for, for example, net infrastructure, for, net, uh, for electrolyzers and all these um, um, facilities that we need for our transformation as well. And I think we have to speed up in order not to get um, behi behind uh, in this global competition. So this is a little bit an illustration and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Veronica. Mm -hmm. I think we take all the three uh, statements and I would like uh, Elena to give your statement now. Hello. Uh, Hello. Shall I share the slides or? Shall Who will share the slides? I'm happy to do it, but I cannot, uh, I'm not allowed. To. I would need to get the per permission for this. Yes, fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. And uh, it was very interesting to listen to Veronica and to have such a such a general perspective of the situation. So I will be talking of much more narrow aspect here. So in part, uh, I will be just looking at part of what she described. I will look at gas, but I would like to discuss what are the implications of substituting Russian gas by gas from other sources. Okay. As you, I'm sure you all know, so uh, a reduction in Russian gas supplies is a major contributor to the ongoing crisis in the EU. Prior to the crisis, Russian gas constituted more than 40-45% of EU gas imports, including LNG. If you will look at the current year until last week, it's more like 18%, and that's, that is not counting Russian LNG, that's only for pipeline gas. And if you limit ourselves to last month, then it's only around 7%. So this graph shows you the evolution of uh, Russian gas imports in comparison to total EU gas imports in the in 2021 and in 2022. So EU has developed a strategy to cope with the stored shortage, and the strategy is sub summarized in Repower Plan. But uh, it is also uh, was widely discussed in academic circles, in policy circles, and in media. And basically, it combines the uh, attempts to diversify gas supply by importing gas from other suppliers and also increasing domestic production, using other fuels partially, such as coal, oil, and nuclear, improving energy efficiency, reducing demand, and in the longer term, accelerating green transition. So what I would like to focus on is the first part, diversification of gas supply. And I would like to discuss how does it really square with the green transition perspectives. Uh, if you look at the total gas imports in the EU, then in 2022, as of now, they have been very similar to those in 2021. And as, as we already know, the Russian gas supply has declined, so the uh, major replacement came from LNG. So currently, LNG uh, uh, constitutes the highest share of uh, uh, EU gas imports. It's around 37% from the beginning of 2022 to, uh, well, last week. And as LNG uh, in Europe has faced certain infrastructural difficulties, there is a ma massive infrastructural investment currently undertaken and planned for the nearest future to improve the role of LNG and to increase LNG intake in the EU. So around uh, 10 billion cubic meters of regasification facilities are planned to be introduced in 2022, another 51 in 2023, 17 in 2024, and so on and so forth. So is this new EU reliance on LNG a good news for green transition or not? Uh, one may say that potentially it is a good news because, as Veronica has mentioned, gas is widely seen as transitional fuel because it is associated with low, lower emissions, lowest emissions actually among all fossil fuels, and it is even included by the EU into the sustainable finance taxonomy that was uh, publicized in July 2022. I would like to discuss this point specifically. So uh, I would argue that actually such reliance on LNG is not necessarily that green. To start with, environmental benefits of LNG may actually be overstated. Uh, uh, I will start with natural ga gas in general. Uh, natural gas is mostly methane, and methane leakages and emissions associated with gas production and combustion 
according to the modern research, seem to be underestimated by the range between 20 and 60 percent, depending on which production we are talking about. Why do we care? Well, we care because methane is actually uh, having much stronger uh, global warming potential than uh, CO2. So if we look at the 20 years horizon, the potential of methane is more than 87 si times higher than CO2. It declines to 36 times uh, higher global warming potential if you look at the 100 years horizon. Still, it's much more significant. So basically, the relative position of natural gas uh, towards other fossil fuels may be not as strong as originally thought of. Another problem is that LNG imports more than pipeline gas, specifically for the EU. And this is due to liquefaction, transportation, and degasification, which are pros, uh, which are uh, components of LNG creation, and they are energy and emission intense, and also subject to methane leaks. Uh, leaks. So here I share a little graph that I adopted uh, from a recent publication of uh, Rustat Energy, in Norwegian Energy Consultancy, that uh, provides their assessment of CO2 emission intensi intensity prior to combustion, so from wellhead to the market, for uh, different sources of gas supplies uh, to Europe, and it shows that uh, on average LNG is more than twice as intense as the Russian pipeline gas and almost 10 times as intense as Norwegian pipeline gas. There could be different estimates, but I mean, we can discuss the range, but it is striking to see the difference. Another component is that current uh, LNG imports in Europe, uh, the largest component of LNG actually comes, comes from the US, which in turn comes from shale gas mostly. And whether shale gas is worse than coal, it's not clear, but there's a number of articles that suggest that it might be key, the case, especially if you look at the first 20 years after the emissions. Okay? So getting back to some information from the same Riustad report, they provide their assessment of CO2 emissions, again, prior to combustion for the European grass imports for different scenarios. So what they expect to happen is that in 2022, we will, we will uh, have higher emissions due to increase in LNG, and they may become even higher if Russian gas supply ceases completely, or there is current, uh, as little Russian gas currently consumed in Europe as it is now. Well, I don't think scenario one is realistic, so I don't, I don't really want to discuss it. Uh, this is not exactly where uh, the uh, not-so-green perspective for, on LNG ends, because new investment into LNG may create carbon locks in. That is, they may delay adoption of renewable technologies. This is a well-known story. But basically, in new LNG facilities, they would have a technical lifespan of several decades, and around half of EU LNG contracts currently are long-term. And Veronica has discussed different issues, with, uh, like how to go around it, but uh, if we don't manage to go around it, then decommissioning these facilities earlier may be difficult, both legally and politically. And on the other hand, if we do manage to decommission them earlier, then new investment into LNG may become stranded assets. That is, assets that are no longer generating economic return because of decarbonization. And that may create uncertainties, and that may create large risks for investors. So... Uh, what can we do or what should we do? So I would argue that we can move in three directions. So direction number one is that if we do any investment into new LNG infrastructure or other fossil fuel in infrastructures, such new investment should be really limited. And it should be carefully planned to minimize the risks and costs of lock-ins and stranded assets. And it should also be assessed correctly from the point of CO2 intensity. And this investment should also allow a double purpose. It, it should allow repurposing for less emitting energy, such as green hydrogen, for example. And this investment also needs to be accompanied by certain kind of solidarity mechanisms that include LNG. Because currently, uh, uh, the countries that suffer, the, well, maybe with the exception of Germany, but many of the countries that suffer drastically uh, from reliance, former reliance on Russian gas, are, also, are countries in, in Eastern Europe that also will not develop their own LNG facilities. So uh, if there is no solidarity mechanism, that there will be further environmental disparities within the EU. Actually, this uh, LNG solidarity is part of EC regulation proposal that is about to be discussed and potentially adopted in, a couple, in two days from now. 
on November 24th. Uh, my second point is that the existing infrastructure for gas and other fossil fuels need to be mobilized and revised. And if it implies an increase in use in coal, for example, I would argue that as long as it is limited to a short horizon, this is probably better than investing into new LNG infrastructure that is going to last for 25 years or 30 years. Finally, and maybe most importantly, I think that uh, there, should, there is a great need for additional support and stimulus for investment into sustainable energy. And there is a major role for the government to play along two dimensions. So government may need to lead by initiating green investments and the reco recovery and resilience facility that Julie has mentioned may be one of the key drivers here. First, the government may also need to provide incentives for private investment such as lower red tape or improve fiscal incentives, providing tax reliefs for green projects, provide incentives for R&D. Some of this is already going on uh, under EC proposal for regulation on accelerating of deployment of renewable energy. This is a recent proposal from the beginning of November. One needs to be careful there because one needs to uh, be sure that there is not much of a greenwashing uh, having uh, taking place. But I think this is a necessary measure if we are serious about uh, green transition. Thank you very much. That's it Thank for now. Thank you. Elena? Thanks. Now, Thomas, I think you are the one to tell us more whether the funds really go in the right direction as outlined by Elena <laughs> before. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to participate in this conference, certainly, and particularly also in this session. Uh, in my initial presentation, I will focus on the green transition in CEC countries and the role of EU recovery funds in this respect. Um, right from the start, I would like to present the key takeaways I would like to convey. First, it is high time as we probably all know, to foster green transition with a view to addressing climate change as the major medium and long-term economic challenge. In this context, one must say that uh, most CEC uh, countries are still green transition laggards. Although their greenhouse gas emissions are sharply lower against 1990 on the back of economic transition. Unfortunately, since 2008, they have made comparatively small progress with respect to further cuts in greenhouse gas emissions. However, on the upside, post-pandemic EU funds envisaged for spending in the years 2021 to 2026 according to the National Recovery and Resilience Plans for CEC countries, appear to be appropriately addressing the climate-related weaknesses in these countries. So now let's go step by step. First, I would like to have a brief stock taking on greenhouse gas emissions in CEC countries in the year 2019, so just uh, before the pandemic. And the initial step would be to compare the CEC countries on aggregate with the other EU countries termed EU16 on aggregate. And I would like to invite you to briefly consider for yourself the question, would you expect to have higher or lower greenhouse gas emissions per capita in CEC than in other EU countries. <laughs> so the answer is greenhouse gas emissions per capita are almost equal, equal on aggregate in both country groups. After slower progress in CEC countries since 2008, you see the difference between the diamond and the upper ceiling of the column. It's clear that EU16 on aggregate had larger progress in the recent decade. Is this now a good news or bad news for CEC countries? Well, I would argue it's rather 
not really a good news to have an equal level emissions per capita because we have much lower GDP per capita in CEC countries and therefore the carbon intensity in CEC economies is still much higher. And this is calculated at uh, GDP per purchasing power parity. Uh, it's even more higher when calculating uh, at exchange rate. At the same time, I think it's very important to stress that comparing country groups is not really uh, the final step. It's important also to look at the heterogeneity within country groups. And first, I would also like to stress that this heterogeneity is also present within the EU 16 country group. Uh, apart from the outliers, Luxembourg and Malta, where I can argue these are small countries with particular features, uh, also there is a large difference between Netherlands, for instance, and Ireland on the one hand, and Portugal and Sweden on the other hand. And there is considerable heterogeneity also among CEC countries. You see on the left-hand side, Czechia, Estonia, Poland, on the other hand, Croatia, Romania. So there's a huge difference in emissions per capita. And clearly, Czechia and Poland is very large economies in the country group. Within this country group, they lift upwards the average for the whole uh, region. Now, these are total emissions uh, per capita. That means emissions per capita of the total economy. Now we uh, go a step further and look at the sectoral composition of these uh, emissions. Uh, and in particular, we will highlight two sectors, which are quite important sectors with respect to emissions, uh, namely energy industries and transport sector. Uh, energy industries emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, are substantially larger on average in CEC countries than in EU16 country group. You see the purple segment. The purple segment is related to energy industries. And you see the average for CEC countries. There, this segment is higher, considerably higher than uh, in EU16 countries. And the opposite is the case uh, for the transport sector. In the transport sector, it's the other way around. At the same time, one must stress that there is sizable heterogeneity also in sectoral emissions. Uh, you see, in case of energy industries, much higher uh, emissions in Czechia and Poland uh, as in Ch Croatia and Romania. And in Latvia, Lithuania and Slovenia, we have <coughs> transport sector emissions which are close to or even above uh, the EU16 average. So this, is, this was the brief stock taking on the situation of greenhouse gas emissions in the year 2019, before the pandemic. And we all know in the course of the pandemic, emissions generally uh, went down in the year 2020. And in the wake of the pandemic, also the European Union decided to set up large EU recovery funds, uh, particularly focusing on the strategic uh, longer term goals of the European Union, namely digitalization and uh, green transition. And the good news is that uh, CEC EU countries are among the main beneficiaries of EU grants for recovery and resilience plans, payouts in the year 2021 to 2026. So these cumulated payouts are shown here as a percentage of annual GDP in the year 2021. And you see the filled columns, are, they relate to the CEC countries. And we see that they have quite large uh, levels. Uh, and then there is a green segment within each column. Uh, this relates to the climate related measures under these uh, recovery plans. Um, now, zooming in into these climate-related measures, on aggregate in the European Union, uh, more than 75% of uh, grants for climate-related recovery and resilience plan measures fall into three policy areas. Sustainable mobility, 
energy efficiency and renewable energy. Now, the next question is certainly, uh, is this spending uh, appropriately focused for each uh, country? And here I would like to show uh, three uh, cases, so three examples. First, you already know energy industries is a very important sector. We look at the case of energy industries. And here we can see that uh, this chart shows uh, with the line 100, the average uh, levels for the European Union 27. You can see that CEC countries whose energy industries emissions are far above uh, EU27 average, they also dedicate an above average share of total climate related EU grants to renewable energy. So basically this is good news addressing climate related weaknesses. Then in terms of energy efficiency, most CEC countries whose energy intensity is above the EU27 average, they dedicate an above average share of their total climate related EU grants uh, to energy efficiency measures. And finally, uh, the transport sector. Here we can see that CEC countries whose transport sector emissions are far above the CEC average, that means above or close to the EU27 average, namely Slovenia, Lithuania, Latvia, as I already mentioned before, they dedicate the largest share of their climate-related grants to sustainable mobility. And the same is true also for two CEC countries that have had particularly high growth rates of transport sector emissions in recent years, namely Poland and Romania. So coming to the conclusions, you already know the first point, our ex-ante assessment Post-pandemic EU funds envisaged for spending in, the, in a five years uh, period, or six years period better, uh, they appear to appropriately address climate-related weaknesses. However, certainly this is not an ex post evaluation. Uh, for an ex post evaluation, from our point of view, comparing climate-related uh, recovery and resilience expenditures by policy area, with changes in sectoral emissions would be an avenue to uh, conduct a performance-based uh, ex post evaluation in the future. And for such evaluation, certainly uh, one has to bear in mind this is clearly complicated by the fact that there are the impact of other external shocks, in particular the uh, impact of the Russia's war against Ukraine. Uh, this is bound to interfere with the effects of this policy intervention. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much to all three speakers for having uh, set such a rich table uh, from which we can now, I think, pick many things to discuss upon. I'm looking at Ingrid. Are there any comments in the chat? And I would like to ask the audience here if you have um, questions, comments, and or differing observations. So please, the gentleman at the back, and then uh, Robert. Thank you uh, for your presentations. I want to put up two points. Uh, first point is, and you have mentioned it already, is uh, the shortage of labors, and this is really a threat. And it is especially a threat for CCE countries because the good labors are migrating to Austria, to Germany because of the higher wages. And uh, all the funding will be useless, or the EU funds will be useless, is if it is not able, uh, if uh, it's not uh, working, the, the uh, monitoring and, and, uh, and the mounting of, of the systems, the implementing of the system is not working. So uh, my question would be, uh, how much uh, money or what, is, what policy you will uh, uh, focus on to this uh, bottleneck? And the second point of view, um, what I 
didn't see in the policy mix is a huge resource, a natural resource, a resource which is not tackled. This is a resource of uh, bioenergy, so to say biogas from, from agricultural uh, feed uh, stock or even gasification of, of, of waste or coal and whatever. But there is no strategy in this area. We are speaking on green uh, hydrogen, okay, but uh, we are lacking on PV anyway, on, on photovoltaic and renewable energy resources in the energy sector. So there will be a shortage of this, but we don't use our resources which are really already in place uh, in, in the agricultural sector, in the wastewater treatment plants, in, uh, let's say, in the uh, uh, waste sector for gasification of, of biomass. Thank you. We collect uh, maybe Robert and then Scholt. Yeah. Th thanks for the, for the presentation. So two questions, one comment to Elena. <laughs> and one question to, to Veronica would be, um, maybe, maybe I missed it, but what makes you so sure that the, say the, the new normal gas price or oil price and energy price is stable from 2024 on? So I think your, your arguments have been based that some, well, the, the, the hike fades out and then we have a stable future prices. But what makes you so sure that this is the case and what would happen if we have another surge in the, in the prices then in, in, your, in your strategy? Um, second question to related to that, meaning you referred to some policies and, and other uh, dependencies. I wondered whether you can assess this uh, effort from the Commission on the Digital Act, for example, on the Battery Alliance and so on, on these sort of uh, kind of uh, industrial policies in the EU and how they are related to this also dependency on some raw materials inputs, etc., and, and how that fit into your your, your, your analysis in a way. I was very, very impressed by Elena basically that <laughs> reminding us that there's no free cheese for economists <laughs> and we also have, uh, always have some, some trade-offs to also in the green transitions. Uh, and one question to, to Thomas, uh, you referred to the higher energy intensity and GHG uh, energy, uh, intensity in the, in the Central Eastern European countries in the production sphere basically. But some of the production is basically produced because we are consumers. So did you also look at the, the footprint uh, uh, of the well, <laughs> receiver of the GHG emissions in, in the Central Eastern European countries? So in a way that we are responsible for the consumption or for the exports these countries are doing on behalf of our uh, industries or firms. Thank you. I think we take also Scholz's question and then we make a round here on the panel. Thank you very much. Uh, so one question to, to Veronica and one to, one to Thomas. So for, for, for Veronica, my, my question is that, do I understand from your chart well that the plan is to provide subsidies up to 2026 until you know you show that the, the current futures prices will go down to the, to the new normal, uh, which looks an, an extraordinarily long period to me. And also, can you please clarify whether this is for households or also for industrial users? And if it's for industrial users, how does it uh, comply with, uh, with the stated rules? And, and ultimately, if these long subsidies, how they will still foster uh, consumption reduction if, if they are in place. And for, for Thomas, uh, <coughs> yes, I mean, your number was very interesting. <laughs> slowing a slow progress in CE countries in, in terms of, of uh, emission reduction, even though the initial level was not that high. But I wonder about the EU funds, because also the, the Commission said that in the previous financial framework from 2014 to 2020, the climate mainstreaming was 20% of total EU funds, and uh, which is a large portion, and Central Eastern European countries get a lot of EU funds. So I wonder if they got so much EU funds and they should have spent at least 20% on that on, on climate objectives, why they haven't reached a, a faster reduction in, in emissions. And that it has implications also for the future that now mm -hmm. they get even mm -hmm. more, how effective that's going to be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Um, who would like to start? We have a big green. Maybe Veronica? Yeah, yeah. I can start. Yeah. So that was a... Uh, that was very many could questions. We, could could we, we have, sorry, Elena on the screen? It would 
be just nice to see her <laughs> on different topics. Yeah. So um, let me first um, focus on the shortage of labor. Um, I think this is a really uh, severe issue, and we focused um, on this in a chapter of our uh, report of the German, Co German Council of Economic Experts. Um, we focused on two issues um, with respect to uh, labor market shortages, um, on uh, labor market migration, and on uh, further education. But uh, of course, there are many other topics um, in that um, whole area that we will need to address, also participation of um, uh, um, more party labor market participation of women and so on. But we focus on these two um, issues, and I think in terms of labor market migration, uh, you were exactly right. Uh, we have to focus on labor mar market migration from outside of the EU, uh, because all European countries basically have uh, very similar challenges um, in terms of um, demographic change, uh, which uh, lead to a shortage um, of uh, in the labor force as a whole, not only on scale of skilled workers, but uh, also of unskilled workers. And for example, in Germany, uh, migration offices are very oriented towards refugees and towards checking whether someone is really coming as a refugee. <laughs> and uh, we have to um, have a mind shift, basically. Um, um, we have to shift it from the municipal um, level where it is located at the moment uh, to possibly a federal level uh, to instead the established service-oriented um, um, uh, offices uh, for um, labor market migration, which also need, means we need a big mind shift in our societies uh, to think about migration to, to our countries uh, in completely another way. Uh, I think further education uh, is also a big topic in times of structural change. People will not have the same job uh, throughout uh, their labor market life. Um, and we also need to uh, do further education in order to enable people to work longer. This is a very difficult debate in Germany, but I think we don't get along without it. Um, people have to work at least more hours in their lifetime, and this possibly means that we have, they have really to work longer, but of course uh, in many jobs you cannot work in that job um, until you are 70. Um, so uh, people will have to adapt and get the possibility to um, change their occupation throughout their um, working uh, lifetime. And uh, this will also uh, be a topic that we have to deal with. Um, I found it very interesting, this uh, comment on gasification of biomass and especially waste. I mean, we have a, a big potential in the European Union to also use waste um, in order to, um, to contribute uh, to our gas supply. And there are lo there's a lot of research going on. I'm also involved in projects uh, in this area. And this um, seems very promising because we can really have a cycle uh, economy uh, in this um, kind. Uh, this um, uh, is a new normal stable. Of course, it's not. Um, it's uh, the estimate that we see f on the one hand from the future prices, but also you can, of course, uh, look at level less cost of gas um, that comes as LNG and uh, through pipeline. Of course, there's some structural um, uh, cost difference that comes from uh, assessment of the different technologies, but of course there, there is uncertainty. That's a little bit a <laughs> very, um, uh, that's a little bit uh, something that you put on slides, but of course, if you have to think about it, you have to think also about the uncertainty. Do we plan to subsidize um, until 2026? No, um, it is um, only until um, April 2024. And the expectation is that in 24 already, um, if we um, contribute to uh, bringing down the gas prices by uh, demand and supply side measures, uh, we will be in a safe, we could be in a safe area already, already 2024. Um, it is um, terminate, it will terminate then, uh, but you never know what happens. I mean, it could also be that it is prolonged. Uh, we all don't know uh, what happens. Is it also for the industry? Yes, it's also for the industry. Of course, um, the EU competition uh, rules um, establish conditions under which firms um, get access to it. Um, and there's also conditions under which firms uh, get access to it in Germany. In particular, they have to guarantee uh, produ production for two or three years after they uh, receive the subsidies. 
So it's not possible to, to, to get the subsidy and then run off. <laughs> And uh, uh, I think this is okay. Um, so it's basically uh, to um, reduce uh, the um, toxic effect of this cost tsunami. Uh, because if, uh, if gas costs are six or seven, eight times as high as uh, normal, then many firms, if this lasts for uh, one and a half or two years, then many firms will not sustain it. And this is, of course, uh, would be a big problem for our transition as well, because then we would have other problems uh, than um, fostering the green transition, then we would <laughs> try to, um, to, to address uh, the problems that result from, that, from this. Th thank you. Who would like to take on the remaining questions or also adding on these questions? Elena, I think you were uh, addressed. Yeah, uh, directly. I, yes. Uh, I don't really think I got questions. I think my question was mostly, uh, well, if anything, it's it's on biogas, and Veronica has already mentioned it. I just would like to add two numbers. Actually, European Commission did uh, take, uh, well, did propose to increase the use of biomethane by a factor of 10 over last of over 20 years. So from uh, 3 to 35, uh, now I have difficulty with the units. I will tell, give you the unit in a set billion cubic meters by 2030. So uh, it's not that it is completely ignored, but I guess there is more uh, space for the usage of it. And I, I will probably uh, give uh, time to Thomas to answer the uh, Eastern European related questions. But if there is time left, I would like to also say a small thing after Thomas, okay. if this is okay. So Thomas, maybe you <laughs> answer first the specific Central Eastern European questions. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I think first of all, I, I would like to address uh, the question you raised, uh, because I think this is a bit of misunderstanding. Uh, the, when I spoke about uh, the energy industries and the transport sector, one, uh, this, the whole emissions, uh, not only, this is not only based uh, uh, supply si on the supply side or production based, it's activity based. So it's in the UNFCC data we use, it's activity based data. So uh, that means, uh, for instance, in the transport sector, uh, there are also uh, private uh, use of uh, means of transport uh, enter the emission here. And on the other hand, in energy industry certainly is only uh, 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 in industrial sectors or in energy industries. However, also the size of the emissions in the, in the energy industry sector certainly depends on the uh, amount of consumption uh, of individual households as well. And in addition, uh, the, uh, the item uh, or the segment other items uh, includes, for instance, also uh, emissions by uh, residential buildings. Uh, so here is also a certain leeway uh, to save energy and to lower uh, emissions. Well, not only to save energy, this is certainly one avenue, the other is uh, to switch to a different type of source of energy uh, within households. So. Uh, the problem in Czechia and Poland to a large extent is uh, that coal is used not only for energy industries, but still also uh, uh, by uh, individual households with a l very little efficiency, so to say. Um, yeah, having said that, uh, I think um, on, on the use of uh, bioenergy, I, I, I would like to briefly <laughs> address uh, this question as well. I think one one must be very careful here. Um, perhaps you are aware there's an ongoing debate uh, also between the European Parliament and the, uh, and the Council. Uh, to what extent uh, forests and wood uh, should be used uh, to produce renewable energy? So what is considered as renewable energy? And uh, it's very uh, risky also to uh, have an excessive use of um, uh, primary forests, uh, uh, primary wood uh, to produce um, so-called um, uh, clean or renewable energy, because if this is beyond what's uh, growing uh, annually, so we come to, into problems as well. So uh, there is an ongoing debate, and uh, interestingly also the uh, different positions uh, often within each country, whether people come from the European Parliament or are more linked to the government. Um, and then 
Um, just one minute. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah, that bit. Uh, then, um, yeah, perhaps uh, both questions um, highlight that funding, and funding alone is not sufficient. You mentioned that also labor uh, is important, and you also uh, mentioned that past experience shows that um, the availability of grants uh, for climate-related measures uh, is not a guarantee uh, that this will really um, be successfully implemented. On the other hand, I, I would like to, to caution that um, we have slow progress in emissions per capita in CEC countries, that's true, um, since 2008. Um, but uh, the spending in the, in the multi-annual financial framework 2014-2020 is just one part of the uh, full period. Uh, this is the one uh, aspect. And the second is, uh, at the same time, we had also an increase in uh, GDP per capita. So it, there, there was, a, to some extent, a success that this increase in GDP per capita did not lead to higher emissions per capita. Uh, so it, it's not, it was not sufficient, certainly, uh, but uh, I would not say that this money was completely wasted or uh, unsuccessfully implemented. Um, but I think that the European Court of Auditors made quite a critical assessment with respect to the use of climate-related funds in the previous financial framework as well. Yeah. Elena, would you like to add a last word on the Central Eastern European countries? Yes, yes, if I may, I would also like to, to add that maybe for uh, Eastern Europe, there is also a behavioral component in the emissions that Thomas has described. So uh, European Investment Bank has recently released a survey on the climate uh, that covers uh, a lot of in issues that we discussed today. And while people in Eastern and Western Europe answered almost identically on the question if they will be in favor of stricter government measures to impose uh, changes in people's behavior to tackle climate change, so in both countries it's uh, around 60, 65% that say yes. When it comes to the concrete actions such as decreasing the temperature in their homes, then among those that can afford it, in Western Europe, it's uh, almost half that is willing to set the uh, temperature to 19 uh, degrees Celsius more or less, while in Eastern Europe, it's 27%. So I think it's just like, you know, there was a certain lagging behind historically in attention to the issues of climate change. And I guess this, this uh, gap is closing, but it will still take some time to close it fully. Thank you so much for adding these differences that still exist here. And I would just like to overdraw by one more minute and give the, uh, the word again to Professor Grimm for just a minor point. <laughs> Maybe w one aspect that has been a little bit missing, I think it is very important to see that private investment uh, must be attracted uh, massively uh, to the EU in order to uh, get it forward. Um, only 12%, for example, in Germany are public investment. The rest is private investment. And we have to attract uh, private investors um, to, um, is to invest uh, in Europe and increase our own production in energy, maybe also our own production in raw materials. And there was this um, question on the Battery Alliance Digital Act. I think we have to be um, focusing on doing things ourselves uh, in various areas, but we also have to uh, focus on diversifying, so uh, reducing di dependencies uh, be from, uh, for example, from China by diversifying our supplies. And I think this is something that we have to focus um, very much on, not only with friends, so this friend traveling idea I think is a little bit too narrow in the US and in Europe uh, there will be 12% of the world population in 2050 yeah. so that's a little bit too few people to interact with and I think it's also uh, stability in the world is higher if we interact uh, very openly with many and I think the uh, concept of the European um, Union of open strategic autonomy to be so autonomous as necessary but as open as possible this is uh, basically the right direction to go Thank you so much. Um, you gave the keyword for the next uh, panel, which is diversifying. Also, banks have to do this. So we give the floor to this panel. But before we give a very big hand to our speakers, thank you so much. For this.
Thank you so much, Julia, and your outstanding panelists. I now have the great pleasure to welcome the Vice Governor of the Österreichische Nationalbank, Gottfried Haber. He and his panelists are going to have to answer many questions according to the program, as we see here, and we are keen on learning your take on banks in transition. Professor Caletti is joining you online. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm glad to be here. Very warm welcome. You have attended a very interesting conference. I had the opportunity to drop in at least for a substantial part of the CEI conference and I really enjoyed it. This session will mark the end of the CEI conference today. Uh, I think we have had very inspiring discussions so far and I hope that we will continue for the next few minutes on that. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome you to the dedicated panel on banking now. It's uh, labeled banks in transition. Is there a need for rescoping towards sustainable markets and products? So that's a very, very important uh, topic which is turning to the future. And we will specifically focus on the turning points that we see, uh, the Zeitenwende in, in German, uh, which has been manifested by the Russian invasion, of course, and uh, the implications for banks in the whole CZ region. Um, first of all, and second, on the banking sector's role to address climate change via providing sustainable finance. So I wouldn't like to talk, and we talked about this in advance with the panelists here, I will shortly introduce, we wouldn't like to talk about some uh, of our ideas on how this conflict could end. We will try to focus on the banking implication, of course, and the financial market implications of that. So let me first introduce the panelists here, and I would like to welcome Professor Elena Caletti, She's joining us uh, from the virtual world outside. Very warm welcome. Uh, professor Caletti, she is not only professor uh, of finance at uh, Bocconi University, she is also member of the board of uh, Unicredit uh, Group uh, of the supervisory board. She, she is member of the uh, ad ad advisory scientific committee of the ESRB and holds several other positions I would not reiterate here now, but uh, we are glad you can focus on the very extensive number of aspects uh, concerning finance, uh, financial markets and banking. Uh, and uh, to my left, to your right, I would like to welcome Gunther Däuber. He is Managing Director and Chief Economist at uh, Raiffeisen Bank International, uh, with a lot of other experience as well. I would not reiterate that, that here uh, too. And uh, to my right, uh, Mr. Bostian Jasbeck, uh, uh, I'm glad uh, you're here. Uh, he is a uh, board member of the Single Resolution Board, but has also been, uh, among several other very interesting appointments, uh, governor of the Bank of Slovenia in his previous appointments. So also all the panelists have a very rich experience uh, I can hope we can profit from. So let me first give you a short introduction just to warm up the discussions and the and, and, uh, um, interesting uh, Q&As we will have. Um, I would like uh, to have a setting with uh, two rounds of questions, approximately five minutes each uh, uh, round, uh, each question. The first round will be on the turning points. The second round will be on sustainable finance uh, specifically. Uh, each panelist uh, is kindly asked to deliver short statements, not exceeding, let's say, five minutes for, for the introductory round. So that will uh, be the first part, and then there will be time for interaction uh, and Q&A with the audience. Uh, let me start with a short introduction to the topics uh, I would like to discuss, and perhaps we can have the um, presentation which is prepared. Thank you. Uh, well, let me start with the first slide. It's four charts that should emphasize uh, the fact that we are on a turning point. Uh, in the left graph, you see 
there is a period of high inflation, a period of low growth, and uh, we see that economic challenges increase in those demanding times. I would love to say a lot more uh, on all of those graphs, but uh, given the fact that I would constrain myself also to not more than three to five minutes, I will be very brief on that. But I think it's, it's clear what you see. In the second graph, you see, for the Austrian example, a 10 years interest rates. So that's clearly a, a turning point that we can observe here. And that leads to a change in business models or in, in uh, the possibility of business models of commercial banks. It has an impact on financial markets. It has an impact on real estate markets. We just discussed that in the press conference uh, this morning and so on. So that's clearly very different from the period before. Then we have supply chain pressures. And uh, there has been a lot of discussion on where is uh, the current economic situation heading to. But what we clearly can say is that we have limitations on the supply side, that there is a supply side shock. We can discuss if there is a demand side shock as well. But certainly the supply side is affected right now. And that won't change in the near future because we learned from the Russian war against Ukraine that uh, supply chains for energy, for natural gas, and for several other goods and services won't return to business as we thought it was usual before. So what we also see, and that's... Uh, what most economists, eco economists perhaps would not have expected before is that in that current situation, labor markets are very tight. We are close to full employment. Uh, of course, there are local differences in different markets and different regions. But globally speaking, we have very tight labor markets, uh, which is also kind of a turning point in that situation. So concerning the European banks, well, they built up resilience. And the question is, will it be sufficient for the future challenges being ahead of us? So if you look at the charts again, you see the number of euro area banks has uh, declined for a while to historically lows. Cost efficiency is, yeah, you would say very high because low numbers need a low cost to income ratio. The level of non-performing loans is as at historical lows as well. And, uh, well, the capital, uh, um, the capital um, we see at the banks is uh, on very high levels. So we have a turning point in several aspects. But, of course, the most important one is sustainable finance issues we have to observe. So um, what is ahead of us is switching from international negotiations to the implementation stage. That will be a turning point as well. Um, we see that the external interruptions and disruptions, it's, it's quite euphemistic, I know, uh, that impacts transition efforts, of course, because high energy prices speed up transition on the one hand. On the other hand, pressure on GDP and wealth might be adverse to transition processes. And the key questions we will try to focus on will be how to accelerate real sector transformation and unlock private finance on the one hand, and how to promote decarbonization on the other hand, while sustaining economic development. We know it's a very old discussion. Is it friends? Is it allies? Or is it is it a counter? Uh, is it uh, is it um, uh, enemies? Um, well, I, I, I think both can be right. So both aspects could be observed in reality. So there are several EU and SSM initiatives uh, that lead to an improved uh, assessment uh, and management of climate-related financial risks in the financial sector. Uh, but there is also lots of work ahead of us. So let me perhaps stop here. And um, well, coming back to the 
to the um, uh, schedule I announced right now, I would like to start with the uh, introductory first round on the turning points and uh, would like to start with some impulse statements of our panelists. So perhaps if I may start, ladies first. Um, would you like to start with uh, some introductory remarks or should we directly uh, come to the uh, discussion and Q&A from your point of view? Because everybody, there's free choice, you know, it's, it's a market economy, there's free choice. Everybody might also abstain from an introductory statement if, 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 if uh, they wish to. How would you like to, <laughs> to start? Well, first of all, uh, good afternoon and uh, uh, to you all and thank you for the invitation and most of all apologies for not being able to be there present. Uh, to get today. I hope there will be future occasions soon to be again in Vienna. Um, in terms of how I would like to start, I thought we would start with the general views on the main challenges that we see from this turning point from a more resilient and more integrated European banking system. So if it is fine with you, I could start already addressing that point. Uh, or otherwise, you can ask the other two panelists first, as you, as you prefer. Yeah, would be great. If, if you can start with your thoughts on Zeitenwende and the turning points, that would be great to, to okay. start the discussion. Okay, okay. well, uh, wonderful. Okay, so then I, I, I'm pleased to do that. So as you um, showed already, the situation is complicated. <laughs> uh, or maybe it's better to say uncertain, although I, I understand that the word uncertainty is used very often in different contexts right now. And, but why do I stress the point that it is uncertain? is because, of course, if we think of banks, we see that banks are benefiting by inflation for higher rates. We see that they have been probably the industry that have benefited the most together with the energy um, industry. But on the other hand, there are a number of rising risks that may materialize, at least in principle. So the question is really what is different from other times, because uncertainty, we already experienced a big uncertainty during the pandemic. So what is really different and why we keep focusing on the word uncertainty in this case? So I think just as an introduction, I would like to mention three elements that may be different relative to past discussions. First one is that we now have a geopolitical instability. We have it and we have it very close to us. We have it in Europe. And we learn that apart from ethical and all other aspects that I don't want to go into, in terms of how this translates into banks and the economy, we know that geopolitical instability can generate a drastic and sudden negative shock to the economy and therefore to the financial system. And these sudden shocks are the realization, the potential realization of these shocks is neither easily predictable nor controllable which means that differently from other situations where we would see a more, uh, let's say, slow motion deterioration of the economy, we can have more abrupt changes now relative to the past. Second element that I would like to stress is that differently from the pandemic, we are now seeing a growing divergence between fiscal policy, which would need to remain expansionary, and monetary policy, which is instead now called to become much more restrictive due to the high inflation. And financial regulation is a sort of in the middle. In particular, supervision is called much more on the hook now relative to regulation itself. And this is very different from the pandemic, where instead the three policies were really going hand in hand. And there were great benefit, actually, from the complementarities that the fiscal and policy uh, and monetary policy on the one end and financial regulation on the other could actually achieve. And finally, one element that is very important to keep in mind is the difficulty that banks have now to assess the risk and manage them. And why do I say that? Well, first, because, of course, it's easy or relatively easy to assess direct exposure to Russia. We know the banks that have exposure in Russia, the ones that have a cross-border exposure for loans to Russian corporates, and luckily in aggregate, this amount are not very significant, but this is easy to, 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 to see. What's much more difficult for banks is to understand what is the spillover effect due to the higher energy costs and disruption in supply chain on their existing portfolios. So this requires really a very granular analysis, almost at single names of their borrowers, to understand what it is. 
Um, and then banks need to deeply rethink about risk management. So we are used to models that are based on past history. And of course, these past history models are no longer informative because as in the pandemic, borrowers that have been very credit worthy in the past may no longer be credit worthy in the future. So what we need is much more forward-looking analysis in risk management, and this is, of course, much more difficult to do. We don't have a history of inflation in banking models, so that is another aspect that models are not very informative because they don't have a history of inflation. So the consequence is that the way banks are managing now risks or actually getting ready for, for, us, for dealing with potential realization of risk in the future is through provision policies. And how do they do that? They typically put aside overlays, or in other words, generic provision. And these are, of course, very discretionary. There is not a clear methodology. So we also see quite an heterogeneity across provision policy in different banks. And finally, there is one other risk that I think is important to keep in mind that so far has been very latent in our economies for decades, and that is interest rate risk. We have seen rates going up very rapidly and significantly. We have seen public authorities, in particular the ECB, changing the condition for the TLTRO. Both of these two elements have big implications for the derivative strategies of banks for asset liability management. And therefore, I think it's important that not only we are focusing on credit risk going forward, because this is normally what we think of when we talk of banks in terms of financial risk. But I think we also need to pay a lot of attention on interest rate risk and losses that may derive from derivative exposures. And let me stop here as introduction. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I, I would have one additional question uh, concerning your double or triple role as an academic, as a practitioner, uh, uh, is, uh, as, as a member of, of, of uh, the, a bank board, and also as a member of the ESRB, uh, ASC committee. So governments have, had, have played a crucial role in, in uh, coping with the pandemic and with the current crisis. Um, there is some fear that there could be a nexus between governments and monetary policy and fiscal policy, uh, which might uh, place risks to the financial markets. How would you assess that and how could we, is there a risk and how could we cope with that? Because you mentioned fiscal policy, so yes. would be interested in that. Yes. Well, certainly you are right in saying that there has been an increase in the sovereign indebtedness around Europe, but I would say around the world. How, whether this, is, um, this doesn't mean that the banks have increased that much the holding of sovereign bonds, but what certainly has increased is the sovereign bank loop also through the government guarantees. Let's not forget that during the pandemic, sovereigns... The, uh, I mean, gave a lot of loan guarantees that indirectly are an exposure for banks to the sovereign should the guarantees be paid eventually. So overall, there is a bigger nexus between banks and, uh, and the sovereign. I think this is fair to say. If I see that at the moment this is an issue, I think there is a very um, uh, careful managing of sovereign risk, in particular in the euro area nowadays. Uh, uh, there is a very big attempt not to create a fragmentation in sovereign spreads. And I think also the, the last decision of the ECB to rather touch the conditions for the TLTRO for banks rather than changing the policy of reinvestment of the revenues of the asset purchases signal is another indication of the commitment, if you want, of the public authorities to keep sovereign spread contained. So... Although it's true that sovereign indebtedness has increased and although it is true that, is, um, uh, that there has been an increase in the bank sovereign nexus, I believe at the moment this is not the risk I would worry the most. Okay, thank you. So we will certainly come back to that, also to your uh, views on, on the... Uh, reaction function of the ECB on, on spread control or not controlling spreads, because that's also a very interesting monetary policy discussion uh, that can be led. But let me for, for the moment switch to our other panelists, perhaps uh, 
Gunter Teuber. Uh, what are your views on the main challenges stemming from the turning points we just discussed about and uh, how could we try to come to a more resilient and more integrated financial market and or banking system? So thanks for the opportunity to present our views here. I have also prepared uh, a few slides uh, that I want to flip through that we have certain facts and figures also on the table. But um, also just to open it up here, um, I think the, pol uh, the conference has the title Economic and Monetary Policy under Wartime Conditions. We are currently doing banking under wartime conditions. We have 15,000 employees in Belarus, Russia and Ukraine being affected by this war and we still have a very fruitful collaboration among all these employees and with the head office. And um, I think it's outstanding that we have a non-performing exposure in Ukraine currently at 5%, up from 1% at the beginning of the year. So this shows you what all the people are doing on the ground. But let's touch upon, let me say, how we see the situation and how well maybe the banks were prepared and uh, what are the challenges. So. Here you see the regional exposure split of Western European banks in the region. And um, it's very interesting that Western banks already started de-risking after the Crimea annexation. Back then, the exposure in the very eastern markets, Russia, Ukraine and Belarus, was at 20% of total loan books in the region. We are currently at 9 or 7%. So there was a certain preparation for these geopolitical risks, definitely banks were scaling down to an extent that any escalation wouldn't, let me say, threaten the existence of an individual bank. And so this shows you also you have to be well prepared and mindful of geopolitical risks because you cannot shift your loan book in a very short period of time. On a very interesting note, this brought also a reorientation of the banks in the region towards EU markets. Uh, currently, EU markets are representing 85% of the business volume. That's the highest value ever. So, yes, there is a reorientation to more predictable geographies. And um, I think it makes sense also in such volatile times to bank on countries and markets that at least have a little bit higher predictability. Definitely, some Western banks uh, had been maybe yeah, playing a little bit more the Russia card in recent years. You see the exposure of our friendly competitors and also the Austrian banking sector increased massively. But we have to be mindful, as I have uh, also already touched upon, it was at the manageable level. And um, I think we have to touch upon such dimensional uh, figures and facts also when we talk about potential financial risks we have in our relations with China. Yeah, because I think the share of China in certain exposure categories is much higher than we have it here. But the turning point we are seeing is not just about geographies on a geopolitical level, it's also on the funding side for the banks in Europe. And um, we see that these times of, let me say, easy refinancing is coming to an end. We see loan to deposit ratios in our region and markets already trending up. But what is more important, it's not just the government side, also on the bank financing side, a massive repricing. So the most secured means to refinance in the covered bond space, as it is shown here, we have already a repricing of 250 to 300 basis points year to date. And I think this effect will feed also into the banking sector P&L going forward. Short term, some benefits from the rates repricing, but on the other hand, Deposits will most likely get scarcer also going forward. I wouldn't rule out that we see at some point also once again a little bit of fight for deposits. While also capital markets refinancing is, is more challenging. And what is a little bit of a challenge in our region and in our markets, currently there is a sort of market discount or funding disadvantage for CE banks. So definitely there is a certain, let me say, risk perception towards this region. You see it here. So CE banks, even they are possibly better rated than, as I have shown here, the triple B financial curves are pricing above that. We have certain funding challenges in the region, especially also in light of the emerald funding gap that we estimate at Euro 9 billion currently. So banks are definitely in a more challenging position on the refinancing side than in the past. And the smart option here with benefit for the banks and the economy is green financing. In the past, green financing was about tapping the market more cheaply. This is this discussion about the potential green yield. 
Currently, ESG structures help you to access the market. And here we have to say that capital markets looking at green financing and ESG in our region are a little bit underdeveloped. So if you look at the pie chart here, the ESG or green capital market uh, in Central South Eastern Europe, if we look at the whole of Europe, is just 2%. I think our region has a GDP weight of 10% plus. This shows you the degree of underdevelopment. On the other hand, what is very interesting and important, and it references a little bit to the first panel, we have an ESG scoring developed uh, to push also ESG financing in the region. And a lot of countries in our region have rather favorable ESG scores. I think this references also to the CO2 emissions previously. But also the EU membership helps here and there on the S and G side if we are mindful about the global emerging markets competition. So we see a great potential here. And this would be also, I think, a good partnering, so to speak, addressing the financing challenges on the capital markets, also with a greater benefit for the society to yeah, push the ESG capital markets financing in the region. And we see a great potential here, and especially also in certain structures that would be very beneficial to the region, like transition financing or also SLB structures. And this is a big opportunity in the region, and uh, we are happy to contribute to that one. But um, we see also that maybe uh, on the regulatory side, we could have maybe one or the other change of the current uh, focus, but we can discuss this later. So we see geographical reorientation, funding and ESG topics as most important in mastering the current uh, situation in the whole of Europe, but also in our region. Thank you. You, you mentioned the possible need for more deposits in, in those regions. What's your assessment on the money markets in, in, in the region? I mean, you get the impression that after one and a half crisis, if we say it's not finished yet, the, the, the ongoing crisis, at least one and a half crisis, that there is uh, not so much trust that we had observed before and that uh, financial institutions and banks are very fond of, of uh, having deposits at the central banks. And uh, do you think that uh, money markets will gain importance again and that uh, there might be a competition for deposits, as, as you pointed out? I think so, definitely. There will be a certain competition for deposits because I think it's pretty clear that the largest chunk of, let me say, real disposable income losses of the households are still ahead of us, honestly speaking. And... Um, I think also here we have to be also mindful that banks now have also other opportunities which we shouldn't downplay. I think in this new environment, for instance, it's much more attractive also once again to issue retail bonds and uh, to attract their savings. Yeah? So I wouldn't rule out that yeah, capital market financing, be it on the capital markets or money market, could be here and there still challenging because current market volatility, this is sometimes maybe underestimated, is really massive. The German Bund is currently more volatile than in the global financial crisis or in the euro area crisis, if you look at intraday movements. That's not a very good, I would call it, yeah, surrounding environment for capital market financing. But deposit financing will most likely increase, but I think there are also more options for the banks. Um, we see it, by the way, also here in Austria, but in other markets, that retail bonds are more and more once again attractive in this changed environment and this would be possibly also the way to go in, in one or the other market. Thank you. You gave us another very interesting buzzword and I will pass that to Bostian Jasbeck in a second. But first of all, would you give us your thoughts on the Zeitenwende and then to get you prepared for that, the buzzword was MREL shortfall. So you're at the SRB. So I think there is no better person to talk a little bit about uh, this MREL uh, issues, uh, especially in the CZ markets. Thank you, Vice Governor, and uh, thank you again for, for this kind of invitation, particularly to Julia for inviting me for, for this uh, uh, very important conference. I'll just have uh, uh, three general remarks uh, in, in my introductory uh, uh, statement and then uh, maybe uh, act as a little bit of a devil's advocate from, from the European perspective. So first, uh, uh, where do we stand after uh, 20 years since the inception of Euro, uh, nine years since the, since the start of the SSM, uh, uh, eight years since the, the single resolution mechanism. 
uh, and I would say that uh, uh, not much uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, European banking uh, system. And, I, uh, and Elena knows that uh, I, I usually say that uh, adjective European is, is greatly misused when trying to define the European banking uh, system. Uh, I would much rather say that we have a compendium of uh, uh, 19 different uh, uh, national banking systems. Now joining Croatia in January, we would have 20 uh, banking systems that are, are, are trying to compete uh, uh, against each other, but mainly uh, uh, being uh, preoccupied with, uh, with uh, supporting their national economies. Uh, why I'm saying this, if you look at the data, uh, the, the, the cross-border uh, lending uh, and deposits did not uh, significantly increase in the last uh, 20 years. Uh, they are pretty much at the levels of 5% uh, of total volumes, which shows that uh, uh, banking systems are, are, are still there primarily, primarily supporting the, the national economies. My second remark, even even Basel in this respect, still doesn't treat the, the banking union as a, as a single single market. It still uh, requires the capital buffers for any cross-border activities in this respect. Second point is that, uh, at least in my book, in the last two years, uh, I was worried at least four times that, that we would uh, uh, enter yet another financial crisis. First was uh, the, the, the great uh, implosion of Evergrande in China, uh, but second was the, the, the crypto call, uh, collapse that is uh, constantly happening, and it shows that both events uh, were, were kind of isolated, if not completely insulated from, from the, 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 the financial world financial system. The third one was, uh, of course, the COVID, uh, and then the response to COVID, which, which again proved that uh, uh, there was, uh, of course, the European response, but uh, what really matters for, for banks were their national government's responses. And then we have a, a, a variety of, of different national government measures that, that help uh, to support the, 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 the banking system. And the last one, of course, is, uh, is uh, 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 Russia uh, war in, in, in Ukraine, where the, 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 the only immediate effect that we saw in, in a banking, banking system was uh, uh, the, the resolution or, or liquidation of Sberbank. Uh, that was the only bank that, that, was Im that immediately uh, fell into the trap of, of, of the, the, the Ru Russians' invasion. So we proved to be uh, uh, build the, the, the resilient uh, uh, banking systems uh, uh, across Europe. And this uh, comes to, to, to my third point, which is uh, uh, then in the view of the bankers, uh, uh, we are uh, reaching the point where, where uh, regulatory and supervisory uh, framework is already hurdling the, the, the further development of, uh, of, of the banks. Uh, Gunther mentioned that, that uh, and you, uh, Vice Governor, mentioned that the Emerald already, and that there are, in the view of banks, uh, uh, additional burden that, that, uh, that makes banks uh, really difficult to, 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 to improve their, their profitability. While on the other hand, uh, it is shown that uh, the, this, uh, uh, this helped to build up the financial stability. So where, where are we at today? Is, is there any turning point today, adding the, the green agenda, the, the digitalization? In my view, this is just one aspect of, of the, 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 the doing uh, banking in, uh, in different countries, as, as I said. I would still consider rather fragmented uh, uh, European banking system. And then also in terms of the numbers, uh, we, uh, th there are some who say that, that, we, that in Europe we have uh, uh, overbanking, that, that we have too many banks, uh, but you have to be very careful because uh, two thirds of all the banks in the banking union are in Italy and in Germany. So it is only two countries that, that might have a, a bit more banks than, than others. Uh, and in this respect, coming to, to, to my uh, uh, last remarks, uh, uh, we are uh, today uh, uh, heavily discussing a, a potential way out. The bankers think that uh, this might be the silver bullet in the in in name of, of capital market union in order to, to help uh, um, uh, also uh, 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 financing the, 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 the needs of, of the banks, while on the other hand, we are, we are still not uh, uh, finished with uh, the banking union. We are all only at the, the second pillar of the banking, the banking union, and even second pillar with the single resolution mechanism, 
is highly fragmented. You know that there are, there are still uh, different insolvency regimes in different countries that then feed into the, the, the resolution framework. And Sberbank uh, uh, was, uh, was a great example of, of how the resolution liquidation uh, uh, play out in different countries, taking into account the, the very national uh, 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 characteristics of, of the resolution regimes. So in this respect, uh, we're trying to run before we uh, uh, learn to walk. Uh, there is still the missing third pillar of the banking union, which is in complete dead end, namely the the the, the edis, and uh, this is something that, uh, at least in my view, uh, uh, generates more worries in terms of how uh, the, the banks uh, uh, could react to this turning point. Uh, but would, uh, and th this uh, this is where I conclude, would still pretty much depend on the national characteristics, and in particular national governments in order to support their uh, hopefully not too ailing uh, banking national systems. Thank you. Thank you for your thoughts also on the regulatory issues. Um, well, let's switch to the question on the rescoping and the products and the markets. So um, perhaps, uh, Elena, uh, if, if that's fine for you, I would be very much interested in your views on, I mean, let's put it like that. It, it's, it's been nearly a decade uh, since we have had several important meetings, international conferences, treaties and everything like that, <laughs> where, uh, it, it, where we focused on having a green transition uh, and, and, and uh, heading towards sustainability issues, but still, uh, it seems sometimes hard to place new products in the markets and, and to really get it implemented, as, as, as we talked about. So what do you think, what, what, what's the obstacles for uh, having such innovative, sustainable products in financial markets? Well, I think uh, the main uh, uh, obstacle, uh, and then we can talk about more detailed obstacle, but I think the main one, is really the lack of policy credibility. So the lack of policy credibility limits the ability of investors to factor in the risk and opportunities of the low carbon transition and climate scenario, their risk assessment and risk management. And it makes it very complicated to also understand pricing, to understand the possibility of placing instrument. So and, and there are clear examples of this, starting with the European taxonomy. That started as really a science-based effort uh, with the intention to define what would be a sustainable um, sector or product and what not. But it ended up being very much greenwashed by politics. And more recently, I think also the response to the energy price shocks, uh, it has not really been only to invest further in public investment in renewables, but it has also meant to have more public spending into fossil dependence. Now, I understand the short-term consideration and need of having enough energy uh, supply uh, to the economies, but the response has not been unanimous, at least, in terms of moving towards more renewable. So I think uh, what we really need going forward is much more credibility in climate policy. And at the global level, not just at the more local level. Then going instead for banks, where banks are in terms of their sustainability policies, or at least in terms also of their climate risk management, that is also li very much linked to this. Well, of course, there are issues of data missing. So we also saw the recent, you mentioned before, the recent exercises of the SSM in particular. Many of them, in particular, the climate risk stress test, if I understood correctly, they were based on data on large corporates, but not leaving, leaving out the small and medium corporates on which data are, of course, much more difficult to be collected. There are, I think there is an issue, an obstacle also of internal skills within the banking sector. I mean, I think all banks are equipping themselves with the climate expert, but of course, the, uh, but they cannot really do it by hiring completely new labor force. So what they're also doing, they're trying to, uh, to uh, achieve uh, skills with internal training. But of course, this takes time and it's not very easy to achieve. 
There is an important regulatory risk, I think. It's not clear where regulation will move, and therefore there is more uncertainty also from the side of the banks of what they can do. But I think overall, uh, we have also read the thematic review of the SSM, I think overall banks have moved and have done improvements, um, but they are, they are probably uh, better equipped in terms of measuring physical risk. And although it's very difficult for them to have scenarios of 30 years, they're not used to uh, think in terms of this very long distant future. But there, I think there is a little bit more uh, uh, possibility of understanding, but I think it's very complicated for them is the transition because it depends on so many things and uh, it's very difficult for them, in particular, going back to the lack of a credible climate policy at, uh, at a more general level, which has to come, uh, in my view, from the public sector and the government. We can't expect that this the financial sector determining it. Let me stop here. What do you think were the main obstacles? Uh, I would piggyback on, on what Elena just said, and, and I think that it's, it's very important, uh, uh, the, the, the lack of uh, uh, credible policy. Uh, there is, uh, of course, uh, a huge uh, ambiguity on uh, EO taxonomy. And then the third uh, uh, very important part is, and then I think Elena already mentioned it, is data. Uh, in principle, we, we have uh, knowledge, or, the, or at least we acknowledge uh, the, the ultimate state where we want to go, but, and it's, at least in my view, much clearer where we want to be than uh, acknowledging where we are today. And there are, again, different aspects in, in different countries uh, related to different banks' positions in terms of their exposures to uh, something that we call the green agenda today. And it is, of course, very difficult to factor everything in, in one equation and then make this one equation work for everyone. And this is, this is particularly true when, uh, when, when taking into account all the, the additional costs that this might, uh, 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 that might be borne again by the banks, and the banks are, uh, particularly European banks, are, 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 are very vocal on uh, all the regulatory costs and, and, and supervisory uh, 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 burdens in this respect, which is true in a way when you compare the European banks uh, on aggregate with uh, Asian banks or, or, or US banks. And, and I'm always very fascinated by, by, by the fact that, that whenever we discuss the European banking system, we are so introvertly talking about only European banks and then, uh, and, and, and as I said before, the, the national banking systems, while we should compare the European banking system with, uh, with uh, the, the, the world uh, uh, counterparts. And in this respect, if you, if you look at the latest data, return on equity in the European banking system as, a, as an aggregate is, is half of the return on equity in, in US or, or, or in, in, in Asia. And then part of the, 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 the difference comes, of course, for, for, for from more regulatory uh, uh, requirements in, in Europe, but also with a very dubious business models that, 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 that some banks in, in Europe are still very fond of. And then on the other hand, coming back to where I, where I started the, this discussion today, there, there, is, there is very little of, of any cross-border European activity of European banks. And th there is no single cross-border mer merger or acquisition in, uh, in, in the last 20 years in Europe. And I don't know, maybe I, I just studied the wrong books, but uh, the books that I studied uh, on the banking, every single one started with uh, uh, explaining that the banking is all about the economies of scale. And these economies of scale are not, are not uh, something that, that we should consider or we can consider or dis discern from, from data that we see today. Whenever we start talking about the banks, we are talking about the national banking system. And then you always have... The, the difference between the Austrian banks, the Italian banks, the German banks, and everybody else. And this is something where, where of course, uh, we would need to, to, to completely reset, uh, step back, and, and then uh, uh, have a, a honest reflection on where we want to go further. And this is where also the, the European Central Bank is, uh, is faced with, uh, with extreme difficulties. You, you, you cannot 
have a single monetary policy in such a heterogeneous financial or banking systems in Europe. And this is, uh, we discussed it last night, uh, it is it's very difficult for, for, for the monetary policy to be the only game in town for so long without any other policies chipping in and complementing the monetary policy. But then the thing is that it is not only about the other policies, but it is also about the banks. Banks are also very reluctant into getting into this, this game, and then it is, uh, I, I guess, uh, uh, Elena is, is, uh, is also a me member of the Unicredit, and, then, uh, and uh, this is also something that, in terms of the Unicredit, with, with all the, the attempts of Unicredit to go cross-border in this respect, always somehow failed, and it is the same uh, even in Germany. For, for years, we are, we are listening uh, and then hearing the, the potential merger of Commerzbank and Deutsche, but it never happens. So it, you can see that it is, it is difficult to, to, to have any consolidation even within the national borders in Europe whatsoever, and rest assured that, that it's even more difficult to, to, to even imagine any European cross-border merger and acquisition in this respect. So we would have to be very honest here and we would have to step back a little bit and then still reconsider and then, then have an honest discussion about national banking system, how this national banking system should and could and then the ways how to become the European banking systems. Well, that's a lot of input we could use for several panel discussions, in fact. So I would try to focus on some of the aspects you just raised and would like to hear of, of your thoughts on that. I, I think uh, there are several interesting points. I would be especially interested in, in, in some first round. We could, of course, discuss all, all of the issues raised. Um, you talked about, let's say, market forces, and you talked about the importance of information. So my question would be, among all the other issues you would like to answer, uh, the taxonomy. I mean, some people claim it's a very important step towards standardization of information. It's very important to structure market information and a very important basis. Others would state that it's uh, not fine-grained enough and that uh, the taxonomy, for example, if, if you're subject to being... Um, uh, within a, a, a certain category. So if you're, a, let's say, an oil company, and if you do some investment in, uh, for, for becoming greener, then it's still brown investment. So what's your assessment on the taxonomy? Does it help? Does it hamper? Okay, so coming to the taxonomy in a few seconds, but um, just to follow up, it was very interesting for me to listen to your comments because we and our friendly competitors also from Austria are trying to leverage cross-border synergies to the extent possible within the banking group, being mindful that in a lot of countries in Central Southeastern Europe, we have 70, 80, 90% of foreign ownership. Yeah. Sometimes we also struggle still with the issues we have on the regulatory side, but I think this would be the way to go maybe in, in Western Europe. Yeah. But here in parts of the business in Central Eastern Europe, we are much more integrated than in Western Europe. Yeah. But sometimes we are facing also the hurdles, but we are trying to leverage the economies of scale. Yeah. So it could be an interesting learning point, um, but we sometimes also feel the regulatory... May, may I just jump in? You, you're perfectly right, but you are reaching out to the East you never try to reach to, to the, the banking union. So there is no banking union uh, consolidation in this respect. And I was talking about referring to the banking, and you're perfectly right. Uh, your bank uh, reaching out to, 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 to non-banking union uh, 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 jurisdictions and, and quite successfully. But this is, uh, at least in, in my view, I was trying to, to, to make a point from the European banking perspective, uh, which, is, uh, which is a bit different in this yeah. respect. Would it help in facilitate rescoping towards sustainable products? I mean, if, if it would, everything would be more integrated, if we would have a true banking union which is completed, would it help? I think up to a certain extent, yes. And that's also behind the trend, let me say, that I sketched earlier. Yeah, Definitely a certain coherent regulation which we have in the European Union is facilitating that one. And as we also have the uh, push on the green agenda from the EU side. But on the other hand, the taxonomy is complex. And as I was stated earlier, it was also watered down. It's partly <laughs> driven by political compromises. And maybe we have to start, let me say, with a more decent and easier approach. For instance, some 
we find it very interesting that the uh, ECB as an institution in creating the bond buying is just focusing first on the CO2 emissions and not on the complex taxonomy, which makes possibly sense. Yeah? So this is something we could also think about. And uh, what is more important, if we want to gain traction in this transformation, we see currently, on the one hand, the regulation and also, let me say, partly the monetary policy, not very, very supportive. Yeah. So you can do uh, green stress testing, you can have the green asset ratio, all this stuff. This is not really creating the incentives, let me say, because, okay, everybody does not want to fail in the stress test, but it's not, let me say, something where you go the extra mile. If you think about risk-weighted asset reliefs, all this stuff yeah, linked to the ESG agenda, or at least the E agenda, this could be possibly much more transformative. We have the discussion about green LTROs, given all the funding challenges we have at the European banking level. And my notion is, being mindful also of the business colleagues I'm dealing with, if you get incentives on the risk-weighted asset side, on the funding side, the people will run much more for certain green businesses than just having stress tests and all this stuff. And we are doing such things even internally, trying to incentivize yeah, via internal funding costs, for instance, green lending. But then, yeah, well, we are back to square number one, then you need the good knowledge about your clients and how you assess certain risks. And that's why we also embarked on a journey on implementing an own ESG scoring where we know what we are looking at and why. And I think this we are still missing transparency in the market on such factors. So ESG ratings, we all know that this is a mess on the market. There is no clear correlation between that one. Yeah? And I think this is also a certain challenge where maybe certain harmonization would help. And otherwise, I think we can put much more incentives into the financial system than just regulatory burdens in the ESG agenda. Mm -hmm. You raised another very important topic I would like to pass to um, Elena Caletti. Well, you said there should be incentives. Uh, perhaps it might be a green supporting factor or something like that. Some incentives on capital. But uh, the question to you is, um, well, and, and, and Boschen also men mentioned that issue, and I, I think you, if there is the view that financial markets and banks are the only game in town, and that everything could be solved uh, by the banking system and financial markets. So if you incentivize, for example, certain uh, taxonomic uh, features and something like that, uh, m could there be the risk that uh, all the other market participants do not the work they should do? So if we focus on assessing what is sustainable as a bank, if we focus on promoting risk weights or something like that on green and sustainable investment, um, does that hamper or help for the real economy to develop green products, to be, to, to be a green company or, or uh, to, to be a, a good citizen? I think it's a, it's a very difficult uh, question in a way. So, I, I do believe, I, have, I mean, I'm an economist also by education, so I do strongly believe in incentives. And regulation is clearly a, a, a way to provide incentives and clear incentives, because if we have a green factor or a penalizing brown factor in the risk weighted asset, that's clear, it sets incentives. But what I would be very concerned with is the timing for doing this. So the timing and therefore link to this, the problem of the stranded asset. Are we really sure that we are not leaving behind too much and too rapidly? That is where I would be concerned with in this structure of incentives. So is the real economy really able to move together? Because what, we will, what will happen is that depending on countries, sectors and everything, we can see, first of all, a very heterogeneous response. But second, we can have that some sectors are much more, some sectors, some corporates are much more able to, to change relative to others, or even some households, because this is going to affect, of course, also the collateral, I mean, the, the collateral banks have and the value of collateral. So it, it is a way to proceed, and in a way it is much more straight, if you want, than taxonomy. But it is, first of all, putting very much the financial sector on the spot. And second, I would be very concerned with timing. 
Okay. And if I can, if I can add one thing before Boston takes, going back to this issue of international bank, a European bank. I mean, listening to Boston, I realize he and I have been discussing for decades because I could have said exactly everything Boston said. But one issue on exploiting economies of scale that also um, also Gunther was referring to. Banks do uh, exploit uh, economies of scale in their business, but what they don't exploit any economies of scale is on their liquidity and capital. And I think there is where the European, bank, the European banks are really behind the relative to others, because with this strapped liquidity and this immovable capital, they cannot really reshuffle, and this is not in line with the single point of entry that Boston, of course, knows much more than I. Let me stop. Well, thank you. There are a lot of additional issues we could talk about, and I, I would uh, love to focus more on the question uh, if we should regulate the companies and the information providing of companies on the one hand, or if you should regulate and incentivize financial markets, or a combination of both. But I think we should uh, let the markets work meaning that uh, the audience should have the opportunity to focus on what, what you would be interested in uh, focusing more and, and talk a little bit more about. So are there any remarks, questions? Great, we have one. I would ask you to try to stick to just short remarks and short questions in order to have the opportunity to get a little bit of a discussion here. Yes, please. Uh, one, one comment. You mentioned that you are looking at CO2 emissions. I'm uh, a member of a European task force on carbon pricing. We started with CO2 emissions, but in the last two years, we concentrated more on methane. Uh, because um, uh, with oil and gas, you have a lot of methane emissions, and so gas is as dirty as coal, as we heard uh, before. So looking just on the CO2, it would be a distraction, and our expectation is that uh, gas will be removed from the taxonomy. Okay. So is there a specific question you would like have to answer as well? And what? Would it be a problem if, if it's removed from a taxonomy with okay. consequences for uh, banks if they finance now a lot of gas infrastructure and it's removed from a taxonomy? Okay. To a specific person on the panel or just to this panel at once? So let, let me perhaps collect two or three questions. Um, thank you for being the Advocatus Diaboli. Um, but if I mean, you have been living this idea of the banking union in your profession for such a long time. You have now presented a very pointed and rather pessimistic view. Why does it not work? Why does it not fly? It would be so important to have it as a, as a shock absorber uh, and to really compensate for the asymmetries which we have in European um, countries. Yeah? Because any shock may come from any side, and we need the banks really to not to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. So can I ask you for political economy reasons, you identify being at the root of the banking union not taking the form we would like to have it? Yeah. Uh, Perhaps let's start with, yeah. with that question and then pass the other one to the panel. Uh, thank you for this question, but you, you've mentioned it uh, yourself. Uh, it, it's a political question, if you ask me. If nothing else, uh, CRR, uh, is a regulation while uh, BRD is directive. What is the difference between the regulation and directive? Regulation stands as a, as a ultimate level one uh, 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 legislative framework, while directive always gives room for national discretions. This is for thing, and then it is uh, in terms of resolution. And I started to sound like, I think in German, it's, uh, it's called Fach Idiot. Uh, the, the, so taking everything from resolution perspective uh, 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 gets me to the point that, that these national discretions are skewing uh, the, 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 the level playing field in this respect. There so to be very short on that, it would mean 
no directives, only regulations. In this respect, it would be it would help to centralize yeah. the, the, the the resolution powers at the single resolution board in this respect, and it would make this the second pillar indeed the ultimate uh, executor of the resolution. But some countries, uh, some jurisdictions cannot foresee. Uh, uh, b Brussels, in this respect, single resolution board taking the the the, the, the resolution uh, decisions in in uh, in in, uh, in their own countries, and this is something that uh, that that then fills into the it feeds into the 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 different approaches that, at least in my view, uh, uh, originate from still national insolvency regimes that are. Uh, uh, treating the, the 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 banks in crisis differently across the board. This is one thing. Second thing, uh, and I think Elena mentioned it, it is the the, the problem of, uh, of of this trust and credibility on European level, uh, which is also of course linked to 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 second pillar and then this uh, famous Article 63 in, in the BRD, which which gives in principle on 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 the paper all the power to single resolution board in terms of, of executing the resolution across uh, across the banking union. But that means that if bank in, uh, in Germany or bank in Italy uh, gets into the crisis, it is Brussels uh, uh, giving uh, and then and following the, 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 the framework in downstreaming the capital and upstreaming the losses. And this is the, the, this is the cornerstone of, of something that is called single point of entry, where you have the, the, the parent in, in, in one country and then the subsidiaries in all the other countries. But whenever something happens at the bank in any jurisdiction, the first question is how do we sort it out on our own backyard. And resolution is always best when it happens at somebody else's backyard. When it starts happening in your own backyard, you mobilize all your national resources to try to protect your national banking system. And this is where, where we, at the, or I would say I see the, the, the main obstacle in, in, in downstreaming the capital, which would always have to come from the parent in this respect, talking about the cross-border uh, uh, or um, banking groups, and upstreaming the capital, uh, upstreaming the losses. And that's why uh, uh, that, that becomes, l l l l I'll give you the example. You have a- So perhaps you it's, it's a little bit, uh, it's not improving the optimistic view that was demanded by no, people. No, no, it's, uh, it's uh, <laughs> it, but, but the thing is that wh what worries me that the things are so tr clear and transparent when you dare to look at them but the thing is that responses to the to the potential uh, uh, ramifications and consequences are always dealt politically instead of uh, uh, purely uh, from the economics point of view or, or, or financial point of view. And that, that is something that coming back to what Elena said, I think there is, there is this credibility of the, the, the European policies uh, and of course trust in, in, uh, in the, the, the European institution in this respect. And indeed we are talking about the second pillar, uh, single resolution mechanism that, 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 that could procure better uh, 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 and more efficient European banking system in this respect. So you're advocating for a top-down approach for, for completing the banking union. It's, it's but the but I, I think it, it's, it, is, yeah. it is the analogy with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with a single supervisor mechanism is legitimate and, 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 and very timely. I mean, you have this SSM being solely responsible for, for all the banks in the banking union. While in, uh, in, uh, in, in terms of the resolution, you still have the national resolution authorities having enormous power when it gets to the, 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 the bank resolution, which coming back uh, in a in very uh, black and white world, originate in, in, in a national insolvency regimes. So let's perhaps come back to an issue where we have a common regulation, and th that was the other question, uh, on the taxonomy and, and gas. So this is common regulation, and there might still be an issue with that. So perhaps, uh, Gunther Deuber, what's, what, what's your view on that? 
Maybe first following up also, um, we were just focusing on CO2 emissions because we have a good data history across various sectors here and this is a good anchor point for an e-strategy. Definitely also valid points from your side to look at other parts. Whether gas should be part of the taxonomy or not, we have to see. We have to find a political compromise at the EU level. But I think on the financing side, it wouldn't be too big of a problem if it is not part of the taxonomy anymore. Because on the other hand, the market is mature and also I would call it creative to find still ESG compliant structures also to finance industries that are not part of the taxonomy. For instance, the sustainability linked structures I mentioned. So if you finance the improvement of a company, regardless of what the company is exactly doing, this is also ESG finance, yeah, but it mustn't be part of the taxonomy. But um, yeah, I think it would be doable, but we need a political compromise and then not just on gas, but also I think on the other part of the political compromise. We are now at nuclear, so which shouldn't be possibly yeah. part of taxonomy as well. So, so if, if to come back to the, the if we come back to the question before, I, I, I slightly raised at least, um, what happens if, um, let's say, market participants depend on uh, the taxonomy on the one hand and um, uh, on, on, on the other hand we have the issue that we have to define what is green or not. So if there are companies who do not depend on external financing for example because they have big profits due to a profitable business model in the very brown, brown, brown part of the taxonomy. How should we or could we cope on financial markets with those companies who do not crucially depend on the banking system or to a lesser extent also uh, to on financial markets? I think a very important aspect here would be also to have, uh, I would call it in the financial industry, a credible and maybe coherent view on these so-called ESG factors. Because I think it's really, so to speak, a shame if you think about the holistic ESG strategy that the largest global funds have all these exposures to Alphabet, to Google, because if you look at those companies, they have massive issues on the S and G side, be it the governance of the company, be it how they treat their workforce. And even if these companies don't need fixed income or credit financing, they are listed. Yeah? So I think a credible, holistic ESG take on financial markets can still be of help, even for such companies, for instance. So I would still uh, be a strong advocate for having holistic ESG views in the financial industry. Mm -hmm. yeah. So as time is passing by, I would uh, have a very short last question to uh, Elena. Um, we now have the Russian war against Ukraine. We have the programs aiming at reducing the dependence on Russian uh, fossil fuels, gas, oil, everything else. Uh, so will that be helpful in promoting the green transition? Or is the current situation due to the economic issues we have, is it hampering? Well, it depends on how we get to the energy independence. So, as I was saying before, my impression is that, at least in the short run, there are in particular certain governments that are going back to invest in fossil fuel and reopening coal or I think like this. And in doing this, the financial sector is also asked to further invest in this type of projects, which may, in many instances are actually in contrast with the internal policies because banks have developed some internal policies in which coal is, of course, for example, one of the, um, of the source that they wouldn't like to finance anymore. So this introduces a short-run consideration that may uh, slow down the transition and it may also introduce some reputation issue for banks that actually are going to finance those projects. But it's clearly an emergency, so as long as there is a clear commitment to go back to a full greener path, maybe this reputational risk and this slowing down of the greener transition may not be too relevant, hopefully so. Thank you. What, what I take from that inspiring discussion is that there was, where, where, where 
very different positions on, on very many topics, but there is one common, one common sense I would extract from that discussion. So all of you uh, advocated for a comprehensive or holistic or common approach, be it uh, in the design of resolution and the banking union, be it uh, a holistic approach uh, concerning the taxonomy and going beyond the taxonomy, not only focusing on, uh, for example, CO2, but also other issues. Uh, and what you mentioned uh, last fits also very well to that picture. So I think there is some common sense, but there is still room for discussion. There is no room for leading the discussion here. I thank you very much for attending the panel. Thank you for being here and discussing. Thank you for all of you listening, contributing to the discussion. And I think it won't be the last time we discuss green topics, uh, we won't uh, have the last time discussing sustainability issues, and it won't be the last time discussing how to do it together. So thank you very much, and thank you for being our guests. Many, many thanks for this enlightening concluding panel of the CEI 2022. It's so hard to believe, but we have come to the end of the CI 2022. And I'm sure most of you will be glad to hear that all the slides have been put on our website already. And besides, with a little time lag, we are also going to publish summaries of the CI in our focus on European economic integration and in our CZ update. Before saying goodbye, I would like to thank you all for being such a wonderful audience, both here on site and online. And I would also like to thank all the speakers and chairs for their outstanding contributions. Thank you also for the conference organizing team. Thank you to the wonderful event management team and the second to none team of conference technicians and to everyone else who has been working for this conference behind the scenes. You have pulled out all the stops. Many, many thanks. We wish you safe. Yes, thank you. We wish you safe travels. And of course, we hope to see you again next year at the CEI 2023. Good night.